Good evening, welcome to Planning Committee. I'm uh, Councillor Shell, the chair, and we have our complement of uh, councillors. Councillor McLaren just sat down, Vice Chair Councillor Neal, Councillor Holland, and uh, Councillor Turner. And we have a number of members of staff. Oh, and I wanted to mention Councillor Hutchison is here uh, this evening as well. Uh, we have a number of uh, city staff. I'll start with our director, Agnew, and uh, beside her manager, Vendetti. Uh, we have our clerk, O'Shea, and we have a number of planners, uh, Planner Lambert and Planner Diedrichsen and Planner Sands are here. And we also have a consultant with us tonight, Donna Hind. You may have remembered her from a couple of weeks ago. Um, she's going to handle the public meeting on the uh, Point St. Mark file once we get into it. And uh, I will do our public meeting introduction. This is our notice of collection that is read whenever we have a public meeting. Personal information collected as a result of this public hearing and on the forms provided at the back of the room is collected under the authority of the Planning Act and will be used to assist in making a decision on this matter. All names, addresses, opinions, and comments may be collected and may form part of the minutes, which will be available to the public. Questions regarding this collection should be forwarded to the Director of Planning, Building, and Licensing Services. The purpose of public meetings is to present planning applications in a public forum as required by the Planning Act. Following presentations by the applicant, committee members will be afforded an opportunity to ask questions for clarification or further information. The meeting will then be opened to the public for comments and questions. Interested persons are requested to give their name and address for recording in the minutes. There is also a sign-in sheet for interested members of the public at the back of the room and in the hall. No decisions are made at public meetings concerning applications unless otherwise noted. The public meeting is held to gather public opinion. Exemption to this rule is outlined in bylaw number 2675 to delegate various planning approvals to staff and to adopt certain procedures for the processing of planning applications subject to delegated authority. Council has authorized staff to use discretion in determining if an application can be a combined public meeting comprehensive report to expedite the approval process. Information gathered at public meetings is then referred back to planning, building, and licensing services staff for the preparation of a comprehensive report and recommendation to planning committee. This means that after the meeting tonight, staff will be considering the comments made by the public in their further review of the applications. When this review is completed, a report will be prepared making a recommendation for action to this committee. Now, I'm not sure. We only have one public meeting, and this, this last bit isn't actually quite true. We won't be receiving a report because this file has already been um, uh, sent to the Ontario Municipal Board. So after tonight, uh, staff will certainly be considering all the opinions and creating a position for the City of Kingston uh, with the um, advice of staff and council. So I'll, I'll leave it there. And what I'm going to do is uh, open the first and only public meeting and ask our uh, applicants to present. Uh, I will hear from staff and then I'll ask the committee if they have questions and at that point I will hand the public meeting over to uh, Ms. Hind. So I will start and ask uh, if you'd like to proceed for the um, 48 point St. Mark file. Uh, good evening, my name is Margo Watson and I'm a planner with Voteng Consultants and I'm here tonight on behalf of Homestead Land Holdings to present an application for official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment. Um, joining me in a little bit will be Sandy Wilson to talk a little bit about the building that's being proposed. Uh, just to give you very briefly where the site is located, it's located in the east end of the city between the Great Cataract Way River and Highway 15. It's located right on the waterfront, so it's located right on the Cataract Way River, uh, as part of, which is part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site at that point. Uh, the site is quite a sloped site. It starts at the water and rises up to Point St. Mark Drive. I just want to speak a little bit about the existing situation and the applications that are being made. 
Um, as you can see here, these are two um, illustrations from the city's official plan and its zoning bylaw. So the site is currently designated in the official plan as marina, and it's zoned, uh, there's two zones, water area P2 and a tourist commercial CT zone. So obviously these are very site-specific zones that pertain to this property. Uh, the property has been in this designation and zoning for many years. It predates our existing uh, official plan and zoning bylaws and actually goes back to an old use of the site well beyond uh, the residential subdivisions that exist now. Uh, the proposal is to redesignate the lands in the official plan to high density residential and rezone them to a residential R3 zone that would be specific to this use. Uh, and this is to, to permit a mid-rise apartment building. Um, just to give you a little bit of history, uh, applications were actually submitted in March of 2013. Uh, a public meeting was subsequently held in uh, May of that year. The uh, proposal that was submitted was for an eight-story, 95-unit building. Um, the picture that's shown on the screen right now is a rendering of the site as it exists now. So there are several um, buildings on the site. There are storage facilities uh, for the boats, both on the water and off. Uh, there are large sheds for repairing boats. There's the offices for running the marina. There's also several areas of the site that are graveled and parking and paved. So the uh, proposal is to remove all of these buildings and replace them with a new building that would have underground parking, as well as the, the associated um, landscaping and a public pathway. Um, again, just to reiterate, the, uh, this use and the associated designation and zoning goes back to at least the 70s with this site. So um, after the original application and the public meeting, there were comments received from the city and from relevant agencies, such as the Cataraqui Region Conservation Authority and Parks Canada. Uh, so some work was done to go back and, and look at the site again, look at the building. Um, with the original application, there were supporting studies done. There was a heritage impact study, traffic study, serviceability. All of these were reviewed in light of the comments. And as a result, some changes were made to the proposal. Uh, the building height has been reduced. Uh, setbacks from the water have been increased. So the original proposal had a 30 meter setback. Uh, that's been increased now to an additional average of 5.5 meters. Uh, so that way you get the 30 meter setback off the water that's required by Parks Canada and the Conservation Authority uh, plus extra. Uh, the building has actually been shifted. It's been articulated somewhat. This is to stay outside of the 100-year floodplain. Um, a boat launch that's accessible to the public is proposed. Also, the shoreline path has been clarified that it is proposed to be a public pathway. And as part of the comments, um, the landscape plan that's been prepared by Scott Wentworth Group has been updated and refined. Uh, the previous proposal showed a berm along the water. The berm has been taken out and replaced with different kinds of plantings. So I'd like to turn over to Sandy for a few minutes just to talk about the actual building. Thanks, Marga. The building's got a slightly uh, split personality. Uh, looked at from the west, it's a six-story boat plus penthouse building, but because of the way it's built into the slope, on the east side, which is facing uh, Point St. Mark, is four stories uh, plus the, the penthouse. There's a, the penthouse itself is, is pulled back from the ends of the building, so it doesn't create a full floor. And, there's, and the building has several components to it, both looking from the left, uh, for instance, on the upper elevation, is a, a, a certain color of brick. It's got a consistent base of stone, a, a brick uh, middle uh, story, and then a top, which is, has a steel roof on it and a sloped steel roof at that. So those are, that's basically amenity space on the top and allows people to um, enjoy the, the views of the river. 
Um, the, it's also is split into three sections, as you can see, both on those elevations. But there's a, the left side is, could almost be recognized or looked at as a building. There's a very glazed, transparent center section. And then the, the right side, which again is used to a variety of brick and uh, uh, brick masonry and, the, uh, and an articulated roof. The, um, I wonder if we could just go to the next one now. Yes. And that's, uh, thanks. This is a, a, a really an interesting slide which shows why these, we've got these two different um, aspects of the building. Is that steep slope that Margot talked about. Uh, we're, we're rising up from the, uh, the flat plain of the Karakoy River um, to just below, uh, or actually substantially below the, the crown of the hill and particularly below the crown of the existing trees. That's something that Parks Canada had uh, recommended and really stipulated that we were not supposed to poke our heads above that tree line. So you can see uh, on, the, um, on that upper uh, section where we were uh, back in, uh, at the last meeting where, the, the, where we've taken off that existing, that extra story, lowered it down, so that from the center of the canal, you can look up, you can see the, the, the crown of the hill, you can see the crown of the existing trees, and as this grows in, as Margo is gonna describe to you in a few minutes, is the, as we're, we've been, uh, we've said we're gonna increase the planting through the, the Scott Wentworth uh, landscape plan, to within 10 years have a very mature canopy of trees, of new trees, and replace anything which had to be, to be removed. By the same token, there are things which the heritage impact study has asked us to look at and which we've respected. And I'm just gonna try and carefully read or scan these for you right now. And because I think we've been able to achieve these. Um, and actually, uh, you've got some great champions in terms of Parks Canada in terms of their stipulations for this. And we really respected their wishes as, as, as to, uh, to try and make this a, a better scheme. And I think that back and forth has worked. Uh, they've asked us to carefully design the building and site work to high standard of design to respect and complement the natural and scenic amenity of the Rita Canal. Buildings should be low pro profile and not exceed the height of the tree canopy. So at seven stories, we're talking about a, not a high rise, it's a mid rise or even less. Uh, many of the uh, uh, buildings in downtown Kingston, uh, particularly along Ontario Street near the water, are seven stories, eight stories. Uh, Block D is uh, 16 stories in, in, in some cases. Um, also, locate accessory uses and structures such as parking areas, garage storage facilities, signage, site lighting, etc., to have a minimal impact, ensuring they're not visible from the Cataracoy River. So the Heritage Impact Study of Parks Canada are asking us, respect this natural environment, let us see the, 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 the crown of those trees behind this building. Don't go poking up behind them and be a good neighbor. Um, and if we can bury that parking, which we're doing, uh, if we can pre uh, prevent the amount of parking and, and visual door storage, which is there right now because of the boats which are stored or covered in the plastic wrap during the winter, uh, it's gonna be, make it a much more attractive space for, uh, for, for the neighborhood and for uh, the Rideau Canal. Margaret? So thank you. I'm just going to continue along and expand a little bit on um, where we're talking about the landscaping of the site. So as we're talking about, you know, it's a very major influence on the site and the design that it is next to the Rideau Canal, the UNESCO World Heritage Site. And it's very important that we meet the heritage uh, requirements and respect that. So Sandy spoke a lot about this profile. And one of the things um, that the landscaping is going to do is it's going to change the look of this site from the waterway. So this is actually a picture taken from the uh, navigation channel from a boat looking at the site as it looks today. With the use of landscaping, with the use of extensive planting, the site can change over time. So the top profile shows the site as it would look at initial planting. Um, what will be planted are, you know, we're talking about a, a very big variety of plants, but the uh, trees that go in at the beginning will already be quite mature. 
Uh, so you're instantly going to get a greening of the site, a landscaping of the site. And you can see that in 10 years already, trees have grown up, and significantly the, the look of the site changes, and those will become even larger over time, screening more of the building. The key, as we've already said, is that slope from the water. So the property slopes up quite a bit. There's tree cover on the east side at the top of that slope. And existing trees will be maintained, except where they have to come out for driveways and the building. But existing trees other than that will be maintained. And then additional trees will be planted. So you're going to get a continuous um, wall or leafy look from the water, but just overall, you're taking away hard surfaces. So you're taking away the concrete docks uh, along the waterfront, all that gravel and pavement, and you're replacing it with a softer landscape. I'd now like to uh, change gears a little bit and talk a little bit about more the policy and regulatory environment. So what this drawing, uh, we showed this at the last public meeting. On this one, we've superimposed the outline of the proposed building. And what this does is it shows the as of right zoning on the site. So in any zoning, there are setbacks required from adjacent lands, and that creates a buildable area. And the buildable area for this site is the white. So you'll see the 30 meter setback next to the water on the west side, on the north and south is a six meter setback, and then on the east is a 7.5 meter setback. You can see from this that you're left with quite a large buildable area, but where the building is on this site is actually quite a small proportion of that entire site. So it's not only a small proportion of the buildable area, but of the actual entire site. Um, moving along, these are two 3D renderings of what could be built on the site again. So if someone were to go into, into the site right now and revitalize it as a marina, put up the uses that are permitted, you're allowed a, a height of 12 meters, it contemplates a hotel uh, and, other, and restaurants. Uh, the, the policy environment on this site has always anticipated more intense development than is there now. I think a key to realize is there is a potential to have buildings much closer to the east side in existing residential than is being proposed by this development. And to illustrate that again, uh, this is uh, the yellow represents what a two or three story townhouse on the site located at the, uh, at the east property uh, setback, the height it would be and where it would be located on the site. So to be realistic about having uses other than apartment on this site, if someone wanted to put in, uh, say, low-density residential houses or townhouses, what would happen is you'd end up likely with uh, two tiers of houses, one where we're showing here and another approximately where the proposed building is. And in actual fact, because those buildings are closer and they're, excuse me, at the top of the slope, there's actually more of a physical impact on adjacent residences. I think you'll see that we do come back quite a bit today to talking about the effect of the slope and the benefit of that in uh, the design of the site and also the benefit of the ability to landscape. So looking at this from a policy point of view, if we start from the point of view of this site is no longer going to be used for a marina, then we, want, we look to guidance in the policy documents of what it should be used for. And if you look in the official plan, there are many policies throughout the official plan, but three main ones that would guide a change of use would be Schedule 2, which is the city structure, and this is in a housing district. Uh, the next is there are the waterfront master plan pathways uh, schedule shows that there is a desire in the city to have a public pathway along the waterfront in this location. And again, uh, we're noting that there is uh, the impact of the fact that it is next to the Rideau Canal. So, if we can look at uh, those policies and recognize, okay, then why is this a good use to have this mid-rise apartment building on this site? 
The first one is it's in a housing district and this is a residential use. The second is this site provides the opportunity both to connect to an existing park and also to extend that park and to extend pathways. So what we've illustrated in this picture is we've used an existing um, air photo so that you can see the surrounding neighborhood. We've greened in the existing Lila Burke Park and actually added in as well the lands to the south that could also be used or would also be used for the, uh, for the pathway. Uh, the red shows, so to the north is the existing uh, pathways and then um, you can see how that continues south. So that's providing uh, public access to the waterfront, and it's also providing a loop in the trail. Uh, again, uh, even beside the fact that we would have a lot of yards on this property that will all be landscaped, just the actual waterfront will be renaturalized from what it is today. So there are things about the site that do make it unique and able to mitigate um, potential conflict or non-compatibility with adjacent uses. First of all, if you look at the outline of the building on this site, we're talking about a more compact footprint than you would see from other uses. So other residential uses could easily be more spread out. You could have more houses throughout the site. This allows more compact building in one spot, allowing for these large yards Again, the landscaping, the naturalization of the site. Working with the existing slope allows us to both lower the height of the building on one side so that next to existing residences it's lower. It also allows for underground parking. And it allows for us to provide again that landscaping to protect the views from the navigation channel. Um, Another uh, benefit of having the public walkway right along the water is it's now open to the public. So right now that's private land without technically without access by the public to the water. The public gains uh, boat ramp access. They are able to walk in that area. They also, the entire public, not just the few who live there, get those views of the city. So this is actually a way of enhancing views towards the water and the city. And overall, this is going to be a greening of that site. And if you remember the picture that I showed you uh, of what it looks like right now, it's a former quasi-commercial industrial site. It had boat repair, boat storage. This is going to look dramatically different on the ground after. So that was the end of what we wanted to present to you. We wanted to present what the proposal is, how we think it fits with the surrounding area, how it fits in the policy environment. And we're certainly uh, glad to listen to comments and hear more. Thank you, and could I hear from the planner, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, um, staff would just like to take a, a brief opportunity to go through some of the chronology with respect to the applications and also speak to um, community benefits and uh, the notification for this, this uh, meeting this evening. So going back to 2013, there was a statutory public meeting held on May 2nd. Um, <clears throat> and the applications were in abeyance for close to four years, awaiting the submission of additional information from the applicant to address the first round of technical comments. Um, the second submission was received by the City of Kingston in March of 2017, and it was undergoing technical review, and on June 9th, uh, 2017, the Clerk's Office received the appeals from the proponent. The appeals were ba based on the approval authority's failure to make a decision within the prescribed period of time. As per the Planning Act, the approval authority, Council, has 180 days to make a decision once an official plan amendment has been deemed complete and 120 days for a zoning bylaw amendment. As the applications have been uh, appealed to the OMB at this time, the purpose of this evening's non-statutory public meeting is to provide an opportunity for public input for council and staff's consideration in reviewing the applications. With respect to the policy framework, staff would just like to confirm that 
As the applications were deemed complete under the Planning Act back in 2013, their review falls under the 2010 official plan that came into effect at that time, or that wasn't in effect in that time, as opposed to the 2017 um, official plan update, which recently came into effect in August. In accordance with Section 37 of the Planning Act and Sections 9.5.25 through 9.5.30 of the official plan, the city will be seeking possible community benefits if any increase in height or density is approved. As identified in the, the official plan, possible community benefits include providing parkland dedication beyond what is already required by the official plan, improving access to public transit facilities, providing public areas, pathways, and connections to external public pathways, trail systems, providing public and or underground parking, providing community and open space facilities, such as parks, daycare centers, community centers, recreation facilities, cultural facilities, and providing public art. <clears throat> Possible suggestions for community benefits can be provided by the public this evening or in writing to the planning services staff. With respect to notification for this evening's meeting, a notice of non-statutory public meeting was provided by advertisement in the form of signs posted on the subject site in advance of the public meeting. In addition, notices were sent to, by mail to all 76 property owners within 100, 120 meters of the subject site. The notice was also sent to all persons who had provided oral and or written comments to, on the applications to date and or persons who had signed in at the May 2nd, 2013 statutory public meeting. Uh, and courtesy notice was also published in the Kingston Week Standard on October 10th. Staff have a number of pieces of correspondence on file dating back to the time of the public meeting in 2013 and have received a number of telephone calls and correspondence since the second submission was received. All of the formal correspondence received in 2017 has been included in this evening's addendum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions from the committee? Councillor Neal. Just two very quick questions. Could you go back to the, um, the greening uh, where you showed the tree line initially and the tree line in at 10 years? Thank you. A uh, question, and this is probably to staff. Um, I know that all of that landscaping happens through site plan. Um, and this is in no way a reflection on Homestead. But we've had some site plans in Williamsville that there's been a bit of a bait and switch on. That it looks beautiful in the, in the renderings when they're seeking approval. And it never looks anything like that when it's completed. So I'm, I'm wondering how we can ensure that indeed all of those trees have an opportunity to mature. And is there a way within site plan agreement so that if you need to do succession planning because some of those trees aren't successful, you have that opportunity? Is that something that can be assured within site plan? Thank you through you, Madam Chair. Um, there's a couple of options as it relates to the zoning itself. So there's opportunities to ensure that there is a landscape strip of a certain width with specific dimensions so that we can ensure that there's appropriate space for the tree roots to be able to take and grow and mature within that space. Um, within, we can require the landscaping and the area through zoning, and then through site plan, there can be conditions put in place to ensure the maintenance and care of the trees over the long term. And I have one more question probably to staff. Can you go forward to where you're showing the four story and how that would relate to oh, so the building? Uh, yeah, in behind. That one? That one, yes. I guess my concern is Homestead being in the rental business, what would stop them from at a future date severing a piece of land and putting in a four or five story stackable townhouses uh, so that you would end up with what the neighbors probably would consider the worst of both worlds? 
how can how can we assure that that doesn't happen? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, the zoning that would be in place for the site would end up tying down what can be there. So, if anything different than what is specifically in front of council were proposed for the site, it would be required to go through another full public process. So, if they wish 10 years from now to sever off that property and to bring in another site-specific zoning request, uh, would that be something that we should guard against? Can I speak to that? I'd like just to jump in as well and speak to the site plan. Um, if you'll notice the access to the site, so the front of the building is facing towards the east, so you have a driveway up to access that. There's also underground parking and the entrance is there. So even though it looks landscaped and you do have a certain amount of surface parking that always goes with this kind of building, but there actually isn't room to take off. You need that for the site. So, so if built as proposed, it wouldn't be, it would be totally unfeasible to sever off a piece and try to put a development behind it. It would in be highly unlikely. Yeah, that's where the entrance to the building is. So it would be. Sorry, um, did you want to add to that? Uh, no, I think both my questions were answered. Oh, there's a. Oh, Ms. Lambert. Through you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> the R3 zone that's being proposed does require a minimum lot area per unit. And so that would be tied down in the site specific zone. Um, such that they were to require a certain amount of lot area to support the the number of units um, within the building. Or it could all become a neighborhood park. Other questions? Councillor Turner. Thank you, and through you, Madam Chair. Just a quick question about traffic flow. Where's the nearest bus stop? Is my question possibly to staff, or who would be able to answer that? Anyone? It's located at Highway 15 and Point St. Mark Drive. It's so near the intersection there. It comes along Highway 15. Okay, thank you. Other questions from the committee? Um, I've got a, a couple. Um, you show a townhouse complex um, in one file, one picture, but actually this is zoned only for a motel, correct? It would. So even to put up townhouses, there would have to be a rezoning. It isn't a, a buy right. Yeah. Um, and I'm interested in the public boat launch. It isn't really shown there very well. And is that kind of an offer, or is that a firm part of the plan, that there would be a boat launch that the public could access? Um, I mean, certainly um, the applicant is, is saying that that's something that they would like to provide. They've made it part of their application. They think it's an asset for the property. There is an existing boat launch there. So not all of the docks that are there now will stay. Some aren't in good condition, but the ones that are in good condition will stay. And um, there's a boat launch, so it just makes sense to keep it and take advantage of it. Thank you, and, and I know one question that has come up, the walkway from Lila uh, Burke Park, all of that is proposed to be a walkway, not a secondary entrance of any kind. No, it's not, and I did see some comments from residents um, with the mistake that they thought there was going to be a, a full entrance there and perhaps a driveway coming from the north. That's not the case. It's, it's just purely for walking, it's a pathway. Thank you. And um, seeing no further questions from the committee, I'd like to hand it over to Ms. Hind. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shell. So I have just a few things I want to read out before we get started, um, and then we'll get into the list of people that have signed up to ask a question. So requesting to speak is an opportunity to ask a question or make a comment regarding the content of the reports and the presentation that's before you tonight, so 48A Point St. Mark Drive. The questions are being recorded uh, by the applicant's representative, and I will ask the applicant's representative to respond to the questions that I hear that you're asking at certain intervals over the next hour and a half. 
Speakers are permitted to speak for up to five minutes, and I'm going to, going to enforce that strictly because there's about 15 people on the list, so you can do the math. If everybody's given another couple of minutes, we're here for quite a long time. We, the, the city very much values your comments and questions, and the city wants to make sure that these kinds of meetings are conducted in a very respectful and orderly manner. So I ask for everyone's mutual respect of everybody in the room. Speakers are encouraged not to repeat information or questions that they've already heard another speaker ask. So a note to the speakers on the list, you're invited to speak only once on the application. Again, please be respectful of everyone in the room. So I, I'm gonna ask every, the speakers in particular to refrain from comments, language, sounds that are demeaning or disrespectful of anyone in the room. Please stay focused on this application. Please don't enter into debate or cross discussion. The, the purpose, your purpose is to share your comments, make your questions clear, and my job is to try and do the best job I can to get your questions answered tonight. Um, I'll ask everyone as they come up to give their name and address so that it can be recorded. So a note to everyone in the room is that I also ask you to refrain from any kind of disrespectful sounds or noises that would demean anybody in the room. I also ask that you refrain from clapping. The city is very firm that they will not tolerate any kind of abusive language towards staff, council, again, consultants, members of the public. They have a duty to help ensure a very safe workplace, and that includes this room. So we've got five minutes. I'll give a warning at about 30 seconds. I'm going to call people up in uh, small groups so we can get people organized. We've got two places to speak in front of me and behind me. So I'll call up the first and second speaker on the list. And I've been asked to, to identify them by the number, not the name. So I'll get speaker one in front of me, speaker two behind me, and then um, speaker three and four. You can be on the ready. Uh, and I think with that, we'll get started. So I'll ask speaker number one to, oh, so the. You want to move this way? Sorry. No, that's what I was testing. I'm losing weight. Oh, you want me to sit down? Thank you. Okay, so we're ready to go. Okay. Welcome. I live at 66 Lime Ridge Drive, Kingston, Ontario. I have two pages to read. And My I'll just ask you your name? Peter. Well, I'm gonna <laughs> Peter Splinter. Sorry, I didn't. Sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. okay. Peter Spl okay My name's you. Peter Splinter. Thank you. And the My wife and I have owned a home in the Point St. Mark neighborhood for the past 32 years. We raised our five children there. My company, Bray Bray Homes, built all but one of the homes along the ridge that will be most impacted by this proposal, plus another 150 homes in the Point St. Mark Woods Landing development that make up this community. It is not normal for a developer to publicly oppose another developer's endeavors to increase the value of their lands. But this is different. This is much different. This increase in value to homestead would be at the significant cost in both money and enjoyment to my neighbors. Two of my neighbors approached me asking for my help. I am primarily here for them. This is not about another NIMBY group objection, but a legitimate opposition to an inappropriate development for our neighborhood. First, I want to make a few short points about the official plan. Because of the time restrictions put on me, I will only list a few of the problems. The city pays millions of taxpayer dollars on studies to create the best practices and to create a blueprint on how to best develop a community. And in the end, it is called the official plan. Obviously, it should have some flexibility, but we are not talking about flexibility on this proposal. We are talking about proposed changes that I've almost never seen before. A few examples. Official plan requirements for approving a change. To be located on a site of appropriate context of surrounding uses. 
The entire area around this development proposal is low density. Adjacent to a commercial area, it is not adjacent to a commercial area. Few scapes of cultural heritage features to be retained and enhanced. How can homeowners' views of a UNESCO site be totally blocked from view, not be in convention, contravention of this official plan? Official plan 272, only land uses that are compatible or can be made compatible with surrounding sites and land uses designations will be approved. Again, how can any rational interpretation of that mandate conclude that this proposal meets that straightforward standard? OP273, adverse effects to be addressed, loss of privacy due to intrusive overlook, reduction in the ability to enjoy a property. I would suggest that having your waterfront view blocked, your view of the sunset blocked, your afternoon sun blocked to your yard, and having people looking down from a rooftop amenity space into your backyard is a clear adverse effect. Mitigation strategies to adverse effects, adequate setbacks and yard requirements. Relief in this application is being requested on the proposal for minimum lot area, minimum interior side yard, maximum height. But let's be more specific. Interior side yard encroachment is over 50%. Height increase over zone, current zoning is 116% and on and on. Just on the technical standards, the site access does not meet close to what Kingston technical standards to right-of-ways would be. The minimum for a road is required is 18 meters. When we get into higher densities, the city is seeking 20 meters. The access to this site is nine meters. High density development should be located in central high traffic areas with arterial roads. This site is opposite to where high density should be built. Safety, I'm not sure how the fire department is accepting this design. How is a, a fire truck with a ladder going to go down that entrance into a straight, narrow, steep grade, sharp turn? And then there's no access road on the waterfront for the lower three floors of apartments. Traffic, traffic, one word, irresponsible. We are now living off a new gardener's road. How the city is even entertaining more high-density development housing that must use the stretch of Highway 15 is simply irresponsible. This is your 30-second warning. To be Peter. frank, I've submitted this application. If I submitted this application to the planning staff, they would make this in an airplane and throw it back at me and laugh me out of the room. I'm done because i got two more paragraphs. I believe that if the Mayor Patterson or CAO Hunt instructed the planning department to have a report in one week, there would be a planning review recommendation report done in one week. There isn't one. Why? Why? We need one now. I hope the city does not sit down with a developer to see if an agreement can be made to enable the cancellation of the OMB appeal prior to the public's real input and review of the staff's comments and recommendations. Without staff having already carried out a thorough report of this proposal, we don't have on record what I believe are numerous, numerous defects in the application. I believe a balanced planning report would have a very negative impact for Homestead at the OMB hearing. Alternatively, if a resolution is struck with council, the neighborhood community appeal to the OMB would be negatively impacted. With both the applicant and the city satisfied with the official, official plan amendments, an appeal by impacted homeowners will, under these circumstances, be severely prejudiced. I'm going to need you to wrap Last up. paragraph. Okay. I'm also of the opinion that Homestead representatives, which is their perfect right, and I, I don't have an issue with that, have already met with the support of councillors and likely now know if they do or do not have the support among the majority of city councillors they'll need for votes. I am also of the opinion that these same councillors who support this application have not gone to the homes of my neighbours and explained to them why they need to lose their privacy, lose their view, lose watching the sunset, and that for them, after having paid a premium for their view and home, paying higher property taxes for all these 30 years, that their family is probably going to lose between fifty dollars to $100,000 in value in their home. I doubt they have gone to look them in their face and tell them that their vote for supporting this project will be and is for the community's best interest. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to, no clapping please. I'd like to go to speaker number two.
And then get number three. Sorry, no, I'm going to deal with the questions at certain intervals okay. of the questions. And so I'll get, I'll begin with speaker number two behind me and get speaker number three to come up to the podium in front of me. So speaker two, we're good to go. Push the button. Okay, I'm sorry, I have difficulty hearing you. My name is Jerry Laughlin, and I live at 80 Point St. Mark Drive. It's okay. Okay. Four years ago, I was one of the main two presenters here at May 2013 that, that objected to the Homestead proposal. At the time, I presented a 38-page presentation with comparing facts, charts, photographs against the presentation of the developer. Each member of the committee and the clerk were presented with a copy and should be a matter of public record, I would assume. If uh, it is not, I'm happy to supply it a second time. Inside the document, I asked a number of questions and was assured that I would get answers to my questions. Now, four years later, I have received absolutely nothing in response. Not a single response to a single question that I asked in that 38 pages did I, did I ever receive. And now a few weeks ago, we see at 48A, Point St. Mark Drive, there's a sign and it says we're going to be discussing this this evening. And uh, recently at, at the uh, Homestead has gone to the OMB claiming the city had failed to honor their 180 day uh, response rule. I'd like to know, first of all, if this is actually true from the city. I'd like to know if 188 days passed without any feedback. Did we not give Homestead anything? Did we not give them my report within a timely sign? And did we not see that that, that report should have been answered? And of course, now we're sitting in a situation where we're at 180 days and we're with the OMB. I have uh, reviewed the documents that are on the city website right now, presented by Homestead, showing all their new development, showing the profile shots, the, the shots of the site plan and so on. And rather than go over every little change that I see between 2013 and 2017, although I would be happy to someday if somebody were to ask me, um, I, I based my comparison, I would like to make a, my bottom line is the plans, as indicated on the new, are virtually the same. Virtually the same. You can take the building, overlay it on a, on a, a site plan from the previous one and go, oh, it has one floor less. But you have 95 units and you have one less floor. How do you do that? I don't know. That's just one example. So I would suggest that it's unacceptable and does not conform to the city's official plan of 2010. Now, uh, the previous speaker outlined a number of points, which there's no point in me going over, except to say, I find that it is too high, too wide, too dense, and so on. And anybody else who would like to know what I, what I think about the whole proposal over four years, it's, it would be what I wrote in 2013, which I could supply as a PDF file if somebody wished, or as an email. Now, Point St. Mark and Woods Landing has been a quiet little subdivision facing uh, but, but now it's facing reduced property values. For example, half the houses on that ridge, there are nine of them that back onto this, I am not one of them, are presently owned by retired individuals. And those individuals count on the equity in that property for their future, which if this structure is built, as previous uh, speaker said, we will have a serious problem retaining the, the current value of it. Uh, there'll be an increase in traffic if the new bridge is built, an increase of noise for Point St. Mark on the third crossing. Compression will take place because Highway 15 has an expansion in the wind. So there goes the east side. We've had the north side, the west side, the east side. And this is a complete inappropriate and out of the character development being proposed for the south end. It's as if Point St. Mark and Woods Landing is being caught in a grip and squeezed for some particular reason from all four directions. And I really can't answer the, the rationale for the one on the south end. We have a lot of problems going north, south with people from the base. They need the, the extra Highway 15. So there's going to be some compensation, some issues with, with Point St. Mark. But that's to be expected. Now, all that said, we find ourselves tonight on the poster saying that we are supposed to be here to uh, respect the process and we are going to talk about the potential community benefits. 
related to the proposed development that might be requested from the applicant. Now that begs five questions from me. One, if we create a list of possible community benefits at this time, are we not capitulating to the developer without even a, a snippet of a fight? Two, is this action setting a new course for the city when dealing with development issues? Three, has the city given in to the tactic of the OMB being used against the city, as it is in this case? And I understand there's two, others, two other structures that have the same issue. Four, is this tactic an attempt to deny the citizens and the elected officials the right to open and meaningful dialogue to give clear direction and exercise control of what developers may or may not do with our city? And most importantly, five, what's the purpose of the official plan, if not to give the guidance and clear direction to its citizens and corporate entities? It is not a suggestion book. It is rather an official plan. I need you to wrap up. Uh, okay, I do, I'll make up. I do not believe at, now is the time to create such a list, but time of action. I would like to encourage all members of the City Council, not just those present for the Planning Committee, to stand up against this attack. Direct staff to challenge this tactic and defend the rights of all citizens of Kingston for it is before it becomes the normal approach. After all, Kingston belongs to all its citizens, not just a select few. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Okay, I'm going to go to speaker number three and ask uh, speaker number four to get a set up behind me. Okay, please, you have five minutes. Uh, yes, I'm Sandy Campbell from 16 Lauradine Crescent. Um, I would like to uh, speak generally in philosophical terms and urge the City Council. You may, some of you have heard the rather touching uh, enconium from the Mayor this morning about naming the pier after the late Gordon Downey, saying that it reflected the city's apprehension or understanding of how important waterfront and environment was to Gordon Downey. And I would hope that the city would keep this philosophy consistent beyond that, because I think, particularly if we go back to your slide of the initial building, it's a pretty appalling wall of, of man-made material between the community and, and the canal. I would also like to, for the information, for Margaret's information, to say that the bus stop is not at the corner of Point St. Mark and Highway 15. It's a block further on, half, half a block past Medley Court. And I, I would like um, Homestead, if they could, to really clarify the question of access and parking. I think you made reference to people mistakenly thinking that there might be some kind of road access through Lila Burke Park. Well, I guess we got that apprehension because in anticipation of the first planning application, I went down with the dogs one morning to find surveying set out for exactly that, some sort of access. Um, and I'm also concerned in opposing this, um, about the point raised earlier about access for fire and uh, the like uh, in the current roadway. So I'd like some clarification on that if I could please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Dunnett and I live at 90 Kenwood Circle, uh, which is the far end of Kenwood Circle. Um, last, when we did this four, three or four years ago, I got a, somebody with a boat and I invited councillors to come out on the boat to see the site from the waterfront. You get a very different view of what's going on if you're in a boat. And I would therefore tonight urge every councillor, member of staff or anybody who is part of the decision process to, to go out on the water <clears throat> and and uh, to go out on the water and see just what it is that you're involved in here and just what a big project this is for that little bit of land, particularly in the context of the United uh, Nations Heritage Site. I would also like to address uh, the idea of the park. That is a beautiful park down there which is well used. If you live down there, you see the number of people who walk through there every day and the number of people who come in the summertime particularly to play on that playground. So I think the integrity of that park is very, very important. 
And my concern is, and it's been raised tonight, and I'm not sure, I haven't been particularly well informed, although I asked for information on what has been going on over the last four years, I'm concerned that somebody will want to put in at some stage, uh, or, or maybe in the plan now, a road from Kenwood Circle through the park into the new construction. And that would be a disaster for two reasons. The first is it would destroy the park. But secondly, the hill where I live, which is the other end of Kenwood Circle, is already a rather dangerous situation where people like to come down the hill on skateboards and rollerblades and bicycles and get a thrill out of it. Nobody stops at the intersection, including our police, who do love to do a rolling stop there. And to add another 90 cars, whatever it would be, going up and down there would make for a hazardous situation. So I would just urge the council or, or staff members to get out on a boat and look at the site. And I would also ask ask you very carefully to make sure that nobody destroys the park and allows access for any reasons through uh, Kenwood Circle to the new development. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, for speaker number five to come up in front of me and then I'm going to take a break and ask the applicant to respond to some of the questions I've recorded. So do we have uh, speaker number five, Nikki Richardson? We're going to take the opportunity while we're loading this presentation, I'll go to speaker number six. Is speaker number six in the room? And then we'll come back to speaker number five. So speaker number six, you've got five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a Sanjeev Sandhu. I live on uh, 74 Lime Ridge. It's a little bit offset from the dive down into the marina. My family has been in that area uh, since that was all woods. We were on the other side in Grenadier Village. And I'm not fundamentally philosophically opposed to all development. I've lived in that area for a long time. And I would give a kidney to have a hardware store uh, somewhere in that area because there's really a lack, there's a lack of retail space. And then the lack of retail was because of a lack of people. So we've seen a lot of development in that area. We've seen apartment buildings go up where there used to be a motel. Uh, we see another little shopping center being built uh, across from another development. We have the lands, river view and all that stuff happening in the, in the area. So there's a lot more traffic. Uh, a lot more traffic on Highway 15, a lot, many more cars. It's very a car-oriented area. Just because of that, one of the reasons it's very car-oriented is because there wasn't very much retail, so there's nothing really within, within walking distance. So now we have you know, uh, uh, an opportunity to have uh, more development, and I'm not, fun to say, fundamentally opposed to it because I think it brings some benefits to the community as well. But having something of that nature in this area, where it's low residential, it's uh, kids, it's dogs, it's retired folks, it's a really beautiful mixed area. Uh, and this kind, of, this kind of development is going to bring in a lot of uh, traffic. Now, I, have to, I have to walk across uh, Point St. Mark now to get to my mailbox, and I, I, and I hesitate at times just because of the traffic that's there. I mean, every, every house, because of the nature of the area, has two, if not three, vehicles in every driveway. And we also have, uh, I don't know if it was mentioned, but we also have that crossing coming in the area as well. And that, the introduction of that crossing is going to bring a tremendous influx of traffic. If you look at the, the way the circuits are there, you have Gore Road that goes straight, that will go straight to the crossing, and you have Point St. Mark that loops around from Highway 15 to what is, uh, it's not Gore Road, it's got Point St. Mark, right where that bridge is gonna be. So we're gonna have an influx of many vehicles for, for the bridge, and we're gonna add another 100 to 200 vehicles 
for uh, this development, it's going to turn that neighborhood into a bit of a circus. That's, that's my opinion. And it's going to make it very dangerous. And the sight lines there now are terrible. It's almost a 90 degree angle around that marina. And if you're, if you're turning left onto Limeridge like I have to do, you have a, quite a blind spot there uh, just as it is. And now we're gonna have traffic coming up from the marina hill on the right and more traffic coming in from that third crossing. I think, as I said, I'm not you know, philosophically opposed to development. I think this is just not, it's a beautiful building, by the way, whoever designed it. I mean, it looks very nice. It's a very attractive uh, building. However, it, this is not the right place for it. There seems to be a lot of development happening along the uh, Catarawakwe River. Paul, Paul Jones or Tom Jones Avenue down around there. I don't, I don't know why this particular site has to be selected given the fact that there's a lot, there appears to be a lot more land along the river area where something like this might be better suited and be better integrated into the existing traffic network. And the traffic from that would flow you know, either to the 401 or to that new crossing and not impact what is really a, a quiet, peaceful uh, neighborhood as it is now. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to take a, a brief pause and ask the applicants' representatives to answer some of the questions that I have on my list. And so I want to reiterate that both staff and the applicants' representatives are recording their own notes with respect to all the comments that the speakers are making tonight. I'm going to call out just some of the specific questions that I heard you ask of the applicant or of city staff. So the first question, and then we're gonna pick up with the presentation by uh, speaker number five. The first question I wrote down was how, um, how the applicant is addressing the, the blocking of views, the loss of privacy, uh, and how that doesn't contradict some of the official plan policy. So the first question for the applicant's representatives. Yeah, if I may, with all due respect, um, we'd rather not get into a back and forth of that sort on the merits and the design. Uh, we think we have provided a very good design and we went through that in our presentation. Um, certainly, if you look at the profiles of the site and the height of the building, there is not overlook to the adjacent residences. Um, you know, so to get into a back and forth on that kind of, of thing when it's not based on the actual design of the property, uh, we don't find it necessary to get into that tonight. I think the main point I'd like to make from what we've heard so far, um, I'd like to speak about the the perception that there's going to be an entrance through Lila Burke Park. That so, is so let me just wait. I, I'd rather go through the questions as I've written them down, and then okay. I'll ask you to respond to them just so I keep them straight in my mind. And so the people that are speaking are assured that we're dealing with the questions as they come up. So the next question I think I heard was maybe a response of why this site is appropriate for this form of development. And we answered that in our presentation. So I guess I'm just, this is your opportunity to just clarify, I just provide a brief response to that question. Maybe they were, participants missed that in the presentation. I feel like I'd be going back through our presentation and I think that for us it would be a lot more useful to hear the comments that are being provided so that we can prepare a comprehensive reply. Okay, uh, maybe a question for staff then. I think I heard a question about why the planning report or a planning report isn't already done. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, this application was submitted. There was a public meeting held, I believe it was in 2013. Um, all of the submissions that were noted were received and do form part of the public record as it relates to this file. Uh, at the time, staff took in all submissions that were received, undertook a technical circulation and provided comments back to the developer with respect to the first review of the application. A resubmission of that application was provided earlier this year. I believe it was in June that it, the application was resubmitted for the second submission. So there was a significant amount of time that passed between the first submission and the second submission for review on this application. Uh, with respect to addressing public comments and concerns, typically staff address those when we bring back a comprehensive report. What's unusual in this circumstance is the amount of time that lapsed between the first and second submissions. So, 
Um, staff did provide technical comment back to the developer and the pro proposal sat in abeyance for a significant period of time, which is why a recommendation was not made to council and council was not able to make a decision within the 180 day appeal period that is legislated under the Planning Act. I think that answered my next question was why the city didn't provide the comments in a timely manner. I think I heard another question about why if, if the community um, starts to describe possible benefits for the community benefits as part of this plan, and this is a question for staff, does that not give the impression that they have, they're showing support for the application because they're talking about community benefits that would be part and parcel with this application? Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, staff are asking for input with respect to community benefits at this point in the process because this is our opportunity to bring this forward to the public and have that discussion at this point in time. So there was a statutory meeting held for this application back in 2013, and this is our next opportunity to be in front of the public and ask questions with respect to community benefits. It certainly does not imply that we have a position or recommendation on the application at this point in time. I had another question for city staff. Does this uh, approach indicate a new course of action for the city um, I, I'm going to bundle another question in there. Are, is the city, um, I'm going to use my words, caving in to the tactics of the OMB to force a decision? Through you, Madam Chair. Um, just again, with respect to the community benefits as well as the Ontario Municipal Board appeal in this situation, um, staff are required to report back to council to receive any direction going forward with this given the appeal. Um, so, with respect to community benefits as well as the um, appeal itself with respect to the application, we're seeking input from the public for Council's consideration with respect to any future direction from Council, together with the community benefits in terms of whether they will, that will form part of the direction with respect to the Ontario Municipal Board position of Council. Thank you, and through you, Madam Chair, just to add to that, in terms of the process, it is a bit of a unique situation for staff to be in, given that this application has been appealed to the Ontario Municipal Board, and as a result of that, um, our process deviates from what we would normally do in terms of preparing that comprehensive report, which would come to this committee. We'd have the opportunity to discuss it with this committee, answer any questions. We would also have the ability normally to entertain uh, public submissions at the comprehensive report stage, which again, because this file has now been appealed to the Ontario Municipal Board, it's a bit unique in that respect. So it's not to say that um, city staff are deviating from good planning principles and reviewing the information that we're going to be bringing forward um, and, and being able to provide some guidance to city council, which then gives us guidance going into the Ontario Municipal Board hearing, which we will have going up and we will be having to take a position and defend a, a professional planning opinion before the Ontario Municipal Board. And then ultimately the decision does rest with the Ontario Municipal Board. And then my last question, the one that the applicant's representative wants to answer, to please cl clarify vehicle access and parking on the site, and in particular, emergency access. So I just wanted to point out, it's been mentioned that a development of this type, an apartment building, would be subject to site plan control. So that gives uh, the city more powers in terms of how the actual site and the building are designed. So that's where they get into how the site is laid out, where access points are, that's what um, controls landscaping, but it also is what controls what the building looks like in terms of materials and where it sits on the site. So there's that extra level beyond uh, the uh, official plan and zoning when you're into this type of building where the city actually has more control over design than they would say if this were single family residences. I also wanted to speak to Lila Burke Park um, and I'd like to put that to rest right now. It's a red herring. There's never been anyone surveying there. There's never been an intent to have an access across that park. It's not even on our radar. Um, so I, I think that issue should just be put to rest right now. 
Okay, so we'll go back to um, speaker number five with the presentation that's up and ready, and then maybe I will get speaker number seven to get ready at the uh, microphone in front of me. Oh, behind me? Okay, speaker number seven, and then maybe I can get speaker number eight in front of me while um, Nikki is presenting. Right. So Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying um, there we're a very tight-knit um, community, um, the community we're speaking of. Um, I've been going from house to house, um, speaking to the neighbors, and I want to relate to you um, that there is a lot of emotion, there's a lot of frustration, there's a lot of confusion. <laughs> It's hard to understand these policies and this information when you're not experienced in it and, and you don't really understand uh, the different policies and the different, you know, this expertise, really. And so, um, and especially with this unusual situation where we had the meeting back in 2013, we thought we understood how it was supposed to unveil, un unravel, and we had more people at that meeting than for any meeting ever here at, at uh, City Hall. We, we all came out, we all had our different opinions, we came with our information, we were ready, and um, we had our questions, and we had our concerns, and we expressed them, and we got no answers. And next thing we know, Apparently, the applicant didn't address anything, and four years later, they're able to appeal to the OMB, and now it's in the hands of the OMB, and now this meeting is just for information, and it's just for benefits, benefits that we're not interested in, we're not even ready to think in those terms. We're still trying to fight the good fight, and it's very disappointing. I have to say. So, we're back at this. We're back at trying to read and understand all of these different amendments. Sorry. I used to live in one of the houses on the ridge. <clears throat> Sorry. For 15 years. And it took us over a year to sell the house. And we had a loss. <clears throat> Sorry. And we moved from there down on Kenwood Circle. And we're still a caring part of this community and we care so much for all our neighbors. And that's why I'm still here fighting for everyone there, because I feel it. I feel it because there's no reason for that building to be that high. It can be half the size. You can make use of the fact it's on the water. It can be more luxurious. And it can charge twice the price if that's what's required to get the money that they need. But they don't have to ruin other people's lives and what they've invested in their property. This was our view. I take objection to the fact when I read their proposal that those houses have obstructed views because of some trees, and that they were gonna put their building just below the tree level, just so those trees peek out. With all due respect, those are unobstructed views of the water. Everyone, Every 
report that I read from Parks, from the Cataraqui Conservation Authority. Everyone took objection to the mass, to the scale, to the size of this building. Why has it come back to with one story less? I have one piece of evidence more that I've found in this entire thing. Let me just review that quickly for you. This canopy that we keep coming back to, the canopy that is allowing them to build this larger height of building, is based on the trees that are behind this proposed building. When I looked at the tree survey, please have a look at it, because the majority of those trees that they're basing it on, on the east side, actually don't belong to them. They actually belong to those homes on the ridge, to those other people, to the single family homes. 20 of those trees, let's have a look. The ones in orange, those actually belong to the single family homes there on the ridge, and then the few there on the left belong in the park. So my question is, can they base their the height of their building, their whole proposal on trees that they don't own. Is this allowed? These are trees that the owners could actually take down if they go, you know, submit for a permit. So that's my question. Can this be allowed? And then a lot of things have already been addressed and will be again. But, and then finally, I just want to know if we're gonna allow a building like this on the gateway to our Rideau Canal, to our UNESCO designated World Heritage Site. Already, Homestead has made reference to their four buildings to, as a precedent to go ahead and build this apartment on the water. Are we gonna start building apartments on the water? Is this the next step? That's my next question. Thank, Thank you. you. Now I'll ask, uh, please no clapping. I'm going to ask uh, speaker number, number, Phil? OK. And then I'll ask, do we have speaker number eight? OK, you can get set up there. Yeah. So I'll just ask you to start with your name and your address. Thank you. I'm Phil Goldman, uh, 72, no, 25 Kenwood Circle. I spoke here, I think, in 2013. Um, I'm reprising my performance then. Uh, I, I think I made one major argument, uh, which someone, a neighbor of mine, reminded me of tonight, that I essentially argued that it didn't fit, and the analogy I used was a a photograph of uh, kindergarten children, and in the center of the photograph is a sumo wrestler. And, uh, and then the question underneath, which one of these doesn't fit? Um, I've been around a long time. I'm a lawyer, political scientist. I've taught law, taught politics. Um, I know that this doesn't fit. Uh, it it's, doesn't take, as, a, as they say, a rocket scientist to understand things that don't work. So I think it speaks to, uh, I, I think, the leverage that a large corporation can have, no matter how deviant from the official plan its proposal is, as against either myself or my neighbors together um, uh, around uh, with Circle and Point Sake Mark. This is a major change that's at, at, that does not fit with the official plan. I think Peter Splinter has pointed it out very effectively, and I don't want to repeat that. I am concerned a little bit ab about uh, one of the comments that was made that, with respect to the park where it was said a road is not on the radar. I worry about that phrase, not on the radar. At the last meeting in 2013, 
one of my neighbors said that before he moved in, uh, he checked with the city as to whether or not there was anything planned that would interfere with his view of the river. And he was told explicitly that is not on the radar. Uh, so there's so certain kinds remind, of I'm going to remind the audience, I really don't want any laughing or any kind of responses that demean anybody in the room. Well, there are people. Go ahead, you've got, you've got a few minutes left. Um, so, so my first concern is, I think there are process issues. Um, I am, you know, I'm here now where I, maybe I should be before the OMB. Uh, I have no idea what I'm doing here. I have no sense of what I'm, who I'm speaking to and whether or not those who will hear me, what kind of leverage they have in, in these circumstances. So that, that bothers me. Um, also, my concern is not so much, although I understand it, the view from Point St. Mark. I don't live on Point St. Mark, uh, but I certainly have some affinity with how they must feel. My concern is the view from the river. I don't get it. I mean, it, we all, it's too late to save the city of Kingston on the other side of the causeway from high density on the water. It's not too late to save the Cataraqui River from high density on the water. And I think that in some ways is our collective civic obligation. Uh, finally, uh, I come from a family which has two or three architects in it. I think the gene missed me, but I, not really. I chose to do something else. This is part of the uglification of Kingston. Uh, contrary to what one of my neighbors said there, I don't see, see this as a beautiful building. I don't see any of the buildings on Block D being a beautiful building. They are very good and very efficient at producing wind tunnels. But, but that is not the measure. Uh, the measure is, does it fit with the values embedded in the official plan? Do the changes fit the values embedded in the official plan? And who is responsible to maintain the official plan, to argue for it, to articulate it, and to defend it? It is the city. I wish I had more trust in the city. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the next uh, speaker, and then I'll get speaker number nine to get organized uh, behind me. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and uh, uh, thank you for being here tonight to listen to the public's voice. Um, very important process, I think, within our democracy, and uh, you can tell uh, for some who are affected by this, it can be very emotional. and. Uh, uh, and I think that speaks to the reality of, of the magnitude of this decision. I just need your name. Uh, sorry, and your... I'm sorry. I'm Hugh McDonald. Uh, I'm a surgeon at Kingston General Hospital. Um, I have lived on Point St. Mark. Uh, I've lived on P Point St. Mark Drive now since 1992. Uh, raised two children there. Continue to enjoy living in that residence. Uh, it's a uh, I think a very, uh, very convenient part of the city, and it's uh, it's afforded a very good lifestyle for me. Um, I have really uh, two, possibly three points. I'll clarify in a second, and and then one question. Um, the first point is, uh, I, I, in adding my voice to the public objection to this, uh, I'd like to make a plea that you consider fairness uh, to the residents and to the taxpayers uh, within that area. Uh, when when someone chooses to buy a home in a district, um, I would hope, and I believe most do, their due diligence. Uh, they look at the existing plan, city plan, the official plan. But I would say more than anything, they use their instinct, they use their gut, and they use reasonable judgment. 
So when I moved into that area, um, it was no secret to me that people were talking about a third crossing that would be in that area. So when that came on the radar, uh, I mean, I wasn't taken off guard. It was no secret to me that Highway 15 would likely undergo development. In fact, I expected that. I didn't even, I didn't look at the official plan for that. I don't think I had to, because regardless of what it said, through a process like this, it would likely be amended as times changed. But for the last 25 years, I've driven by the entrance to this property, and there was a plea made tonight for somebody to look at it from the water. If you haven't driven down Point St. Mark, please do so before you have any decision on this matter. It is a driveway. It is no wider than my driveway into my house. It is bordered on each side by a property fence for the two adjoining properties. So when I drove by, when I purchased my home there, I knew it was a marina. I felt it may not always be a marina, but never in my wildest dream did I think it would be high density, 95 unit uh, condo or apartment building, never. In fact, when I first heard about this proposal, I thought it was a vicious rumor, and how could that possibly be? How could it possibly be? It's been said tonight, I like the saying, if it doesn't fit, you remember O.J. Simpson, if it doesn't fit, you must have quit. I would say if you remember something in your mind tonight, if it doesn't fit, you must reject. No reasonable, rational person would have ever looked at that driveway, that entrance, and have thought that this is going to be rezoned to a high density uh, area. So I think it's very unfair to change the game partway through, to go against common sense, judgment, and also to go against very poor planning. There's no architect that would ever have designed this neighborhood with that there on the drawing right, at, right out of the gate. It just doesn't fit. My second point I think has been illustrated tonight, but, but I, I'm just gonna add to it, and I think just the impact on this neighborhood that high density residential housing will have. We are on the eve, it's not approved yet, but it's well on its way to have the third crossing. I don't think anyone in this room knows and can say with certainty the impact that will have on the traffic flow within that neighborhood. It will have some. Hopefully, it can be mitigated and it, and it will not be destructive to a quiet residential neighborhood, but we don't know. So if anything comes into your decision making tonight, I would say we need to wait. We cannot go ahead with two almost simultaneous major impacts on this small residential uh, community. You're looking at almost 100 units. In that immediate vicinity, there aren't 100 homes. It's going to have huge impact uh, in, uh, on lifestyles there. The third thing I'll add very quickly, and I wasn't going to argue about the plan because I don't want high density residential housing there. But because of the response to the questions that I think were honest questions put forward to the presenters tonight, I will add something. I think their presentation is disingenuous. Those docks that they refer to are virtually destroyed, particularly after the high water we had this spring. But if anybody goes down there, there's nothing really usable. Two, a public boat launch on private land where are people gonna put trailers for boats? Like, it's just disingenuous. And I think one other speaker spoke to that tonight as well. So I'll add that. I don't wanna be you know, negative in that sense, but I couldn't resist because we did not get a clear response to honest questions. So my question for the group tonight is I've heard tonight, I haven't had a chance to follow this that closely. I don't understand the details of the OMB challenge and I would appreciate if someone could clarify how that affects this decision and this process and, and, and how this is going to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to speaker number nine. Your name and your address. Uh, thank you. My name is Alwyn Haugens. I live at uh, 20 Kenwood Circle. Uh, so again, one of the residents within that 120 meter uh, radius they spoke of that received notification. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I wanted to, to uh, again, add my voice to, uh, to the dissent over this proposal and to, to bring up one uh, particular uh, item that I, I found uh, somewhat disingenuous in, in the beginning of the proposal uh, was the implication that 
uh, this decision uh, to have this as a commercial property uh, was made long before uh, the, the current development um, and, uh, and should therefore uh, you know, be, be considered uh, to be out of step with, with what's currently there. Um, they've, they've taken that idea that this is an old decision uh, based on, on old facts and therefore this should be changed to residential. However, at the same time, uh, they are holding on to the part of that uh, original decision that said you could put a six-story hotel on there. Um, I, I don't see how you can have your cake and eat it too. Um, either this is a commercial property, which will generate benefits of some sort, uh, and that can be discussed if there's a proposal put forward to develop it commercially, as far as employment or access to services that, that may have value to the community. But then to go around and dismiss that, oh no, commercial doesn't fit anymore, this is now a residential neighborhood, but we'd still like to keep the idea that a six-story building is appropriate on this land. Well, that's nonsense. You can't come in and say, it's no longer appropriate commercial property, but the height is still appropriate. If you're going to change the use of the land, you need to go back to square one and say what is appropriate in this area. And nothing uh, in the plan or in the city guidelines would indicate that this is an appropriate location for a high density building. Access is inappropriate, all the surrounding property is inappropriate, and two points in the city guidelines that, that haven't been brought up um, so far are things like it should have ready access to a major thoroughfare. Well, Highway 15, we've been told this is between the river and Highway 15. No, it's not. It's on the river. It's over 300 meters away from Highway 15. If at the point where we can say that you can be three, 400 meters away from a major road and consider that to be ready access, very little of Kingston is no, it would, uh, would be excluded from uh, high density development. Almost everything has access that close to, to a major thoroughfare. Um, also, uh, the city guidelines indicate that this should be on the edge of a, of a community, that, that a development like this should not be in the heart of a community. Well, to say that the waterfront is on the edge of the community uh, is as ludicrous as saying that City Hall is on the edge of Kingston because there's a lake across the street. Of course, City Hall isn't at the edge of Kingston. City Hall's at the heart of Kingston. This would also be at the heart of our community um, and wholly inappropriate for uh, the rest of the community, completely out of scale. And uh, Point St. Mark is not a major thoroughfare, and I think that's been readily indicated by the city's proposals around the third crossing, that to restrict uh, traffic to local traffic on Point St. Mark, there have been discussions about limiting access at Point St. Mark Gore Road intersection to discourage through traffic to people using that as a byway to get around the Highway 15 stretch. That, I think, has indicated that, you know, we've clearly indicated this is a small residential street for local traffic and not intended to be a major thoroughfare. Adding 90 additional vehicles um, to, to that neighborhood, uh, also with anticipation that there will only be one exit, forces all that traffic in one direction. Um, I think that, that really to, to pick and choose your bits of previous decisions to say you don't like the fact that it's commercial, it should be residential, but you do like the fact that somebody chose to put a six-story building on there um, is, is disingenuous to the whole process and flies in the face of, of planning. Uh, planning should take the entire use and not get to cherry pick. So um, that's my comment. Thank you. I'm going to take one more uh, speaker and then take another quick break for questions, and that's speaker number 12. So just begin by giving your name and your street address. Hi, it's uh, Keith Schneider. I'm from 33 Kenwood Circle. and. I am very glad such a credible person, uh, Peter Splinter, spoke so well tonight, so emphatically. It is a bit concerning that maybe city councils have already decided. However, I do want to point out 
comprehensive replies from our 2013 questions really haven't been supplied. For instance, the fire truck, how hard is that? Access is not a complicated question, but it keeps getting put somewhere else. How, why is that one so hard to get an answer to? So there is something that I don't want to repeat what other people have said, but light pollution, in my mind, really takes away from a neighborhood. And it's not hard for us to walk up close to the other apartment buildings that Homestead has. And they're nice buildings. I've been in one. It's, it's, it's really quite nice. However, the light pollution in the evening at night will be not only down in our own homes, it will be in our backyards. It will be, as we walk down the street, it will be in the park for people who are just visiting, and it'll be for people who are actually boating on the water, wanting to look at the stars. That's important, I think. As far as this protection of a tree uh, screen in front of the building, I understand that trees will grow over time and it will take time. But there has been an issue. Uh, Brad Johnson, who is a very acclaimed landscape architect, says the trees will not be able to grow the heights or as well as being portrayed in the presentation. I think we have a civic obligation to ask the city staff and council to have Homestead build a building that fits. And I would like them to represent us at OMB in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to just take a minute. I've just got a couple of questions that I heard, and I think they're both for city staff. The first question was, uh, can the applicant analyze their building height based on trees that aren't on their own property? Through you, Madam Chair, um, speaking to the trees that are on abutting properties is certainly in looking at the applicant's planning justification. They're looking at the context of the area, which is established by the height of the existing vegetation. If they are looking at the trees on abutting properties, it's just looking at the context of the area in terms of the setting. So they can use those in terms of the justification in placing the proposal within the context of the area. Um, in terms of the proposed height of surrounding trees that are intended to be planted there or other existing trees, obviously that context may change over time, but it's really looking at a moment in time in terms of what's within the area itself and the proposal that's in front of us today. And I heard another question asking about clarification of the OMB process. And so I think when I heard that question being asked, it's when do projects go to the OMB? What happens with public input when, it, when it's been referred to the board? Who decides from the board? So maybe just an overview to clarify the OMB process. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, so the applications were appealed to the Ontario Municipal Board. Staff did provide a report to council seeking direction in terms of next steps with respect to how to proceed with the application. Based on the appeal, it was the recommendation of staff and the direction from council that we have the opportunity to hear the public input on the revised second submission, which is in front of planning committee and the public this evening for input. All of that input is being gathered by staff. A number of us are here taking notes tonight. Uh, that information will be summarized together with the technical review that staff is undertaking right now, which also includes peer reviews of the information that has been submitted, and staff will be coming back to council with respect to direction on next steps. So in terms of that, at this point, there is a pre-hearing date set for November 22nd for this appeal. Uh, at that point, that is a process that is also open to the public in terms of attending or asking for participant status. That's really all we know to date. 
Um, but there will be further direction established through the pre-hearing as well as staff coming back to council for additional direction in terms of how to proceed with respect to these applications and this appeal. Okay, so I have, oh, oh sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just through you, there is one question that I wanted to clarify. I believe it may have been a few speakers ago, somebody asked the question about has 180 days really lapsed and why are we why are we in a position now that an OMB uh, appeal was filed by the applicant? So the clock for the 180 days, it starts from the time that the original application is filed. So um, as Mar Marnie mentioned, the application was in abeyance for about two years, two and a half years before it came back to staff with a second submission that was responding to the first public meeting and the first round of detailed technical comments that were provided to the applicant by staff. The way the Planning Act works is it, it doesn't account for an application being inactive or being in abeyance. So we've more than hit the 180 days from the time that the actual application was filed, which is where the entitlement for the appeal came from in the first place. So I wanted to clarify that point for the room um, just to make sure that people understood that. Okay, I have four remaining speakers. So I'm gonna ask uh, speaker number 13 to come to the mic. Is she behind me? In front of me and speaker number 14 behind me. So. Th and then I have a new one. Okay, we're gonna go up to speaker number 17. So if I can get 13 in front of me and 14 behind me, and I'll, I'll ask uh, speaker number 13 to begin with your name and address. Mike Trainer, 80 Lime Ridge Drive. Madam Chairman, councillors, uh, representatives of the staff, homestead, neighbors. First off, I'd like to uh, thank all the previous speakers who have all been very eloquent in expressing uh, our concerns in regard to the development of 48A Point St. Mark. Some of it uh, even emotional and uh, wonderful presentations that strike the emotion that this particular th um, development, um, proposed development, bring brings to the neighborhood and the city uh, at large, I would suggest. Um, so we've had a bit of an emotional thing. I mean, there, you've been addressing each and one of the questions as they've come up and, and very well trying to draw out uh, some answers as we go on. So I would like to proceed with a number of questions, if I may, Madam Chair. First off, Homestead refers to the 100-year flood line and where they have uh, positioned the property on that. This year and the early year was an exceptionally high year. That high water mark far exceeded the banks of the, uh, even the embutments of the docks moving forward. I would ask, has the city gone back to Parks Canada and the Cat Cataraqui Conservation Authority to reestablish where the 100-year 100, 100 flood line is? And once that is established, does Homestead's plan actually conform to that? I would ask, is there, a, in effect, a barrier-free parking as opposed in this development going forward? I would ask, it was brought out in the last presentation, given the boat ramp, is the boat ramp in the new proposal, in fact, the same boat ramp that is currently in place, or has it been shifted? And in so doing, has Homestead, therefore, planned to disrupt the water line going forward? I would ask, is with regard to the boat line and the boat parking, where do the boat cars and the trailers park when that comes forward? In regards to access, uh, first off, uh, it has been very clear. I'm afraid I don't, I only remembered your first name, uh, Madam, as Margot. I don't recall your last name, so. Um, was very clear that there is one access point, and Mr. Splinter was very clear that that access point is nine meters in length, in width, not the recommended 20 meters. If a ladder truck for an eight-story, seven-story development needs to get in there, how does it get in there? And if it cannot make that steep turn at the bottom, how do they propose to get, get it in if not through the single access point, if not through the park access? The access, which was in referred to, again, uh, 
Ms. Margot's statement when she was referring to council's uh, ability and to address and have input referred to not one access point, but accesses plural. And I would ask her to address why she suggested that when there is clearly only one access point. Um, with regard to a perspective, it was brought out very, very clearly um, that perspective is a matter of viewpoint. And that viewpoint um, dictates how one graphically represents uh, things that are going on. So clearly, uh, Ms. Richardson's presentation, her last slide, showed the proposed building as superimposed as viewed from the water. Homestead's presentation had no presentations as it would be viewed from the water, simply the edifice of that side of the building. I asked why that is so, and I would suggest that that slide that Ms. Richardson has was from a presentation that Mr. Jim Tuquette made and a letter of protest that he made in May 2013. Also with regard to perspective, Jerry, my dear neighbor, at that time also made another presentation that showed how the representation of the side perspective could be viewed quite differently than the other. So I would ask, has the council members here sitting here today seen those two presentations made in 2013 by Mr. Duquette and my good neighbor, Jerry? If they have not seen, I would ask staff to find those presentations and circulate them to all these members present so they can see exactly what a different perspective might take on these things going forward. We've heard from the staff of the just, ongoing... Just a, few, just a few seconds to wrap up. Pardon me? Just a few seconds left in your five okay. minutes. I would ask, is there, has there ever been a comprehensive reply from Homestead on the previous 2013 meeting? Because I have not been informed that there has been. And they have made an assertion tonight that they will address all concerns that are raised in this meeting, and I would ask to be included when that comes in. I would then point out the many, many, many points that Mr. Splinter eloquently brought out at how this contravenes the plan. I would ask that each and every point that Mr. S that Mr. Splinter brought out be addressed by staff and the re rationale for excusing them be circulated to the members here present tonight. With regards to the staff, they have asked consistently about enabling benefits as if the development is a foregone conclusion. And I would ask why they have not been di directed to look at other options as such as opposing the development and why they have not been directed to oppose the development at the OMB. Given the rationale from Mr. Splinter, the differential in terms of perspective, the um, concern about uh, how it could be very much different and how it seems that we have not yet, hmm, why it has not yet permeated that the, the Homestead uh, presentation, at least from our viewpoint, has not been questioned. Okay. I need Thank you, you very much, okay. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Madam Chair. I'll go to speaker number 14. And then I'll ask speaker number 15 to get set up at the mic in front of me. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, committee members, staff members, members of the community, and proponents, um, architects, and planners. And please start Frank with Dixon. your name and address. Name yes. and address. Okay. And I've written this out, um, and I'll provide it to the clerk. That'll make it easier. I won't repeat the points that have been made, but all the points will come to the clerk. So Frank Dixon, 495 Alfred, Department 2, K7K, 4J4. So I'm on the other side of the river. I don't live in the neighborhood. So, some fantastic presentations tonight from concerned citizens, and I've learned a lot from that. I don't want Mississauga on the Rideau, and this project tends in that direction. I think it's excessively massed, excessively dense, and, ex and too much height. Now, I've been following um, staff's work on the area of community benefits in recent months. I've been to a seminar and another event, and I've learned quite a bit about that. And I'm just going to quote 
one of the senior planners from the seminar. Not to be used to make a bad planning good, but to make good planning better. I don't think this can be classified as good planning. So community benefits shouldn't enter into the equation. This is bad planning for dozens of reasons that we've heard. So one point that hasn't been raised yet is the fact that this is a former marina. And I'm wondering if there are brownfield issues involved with a cleanup of that on the shore and just off the shore from the previous use. That hasn't come up yet. So I want to get that on the record. I'm going to add my concern to the access points that have been raised, but I'm also going to broaden it out into the areas around construction, the logistics of that. If, in fact, this project does get approved or some version of it does get approved, which does seem inevitable, you're on property that's heavily sloped and that you may have to take down existing trees in order to get your vehicles in there, either to park them or to move them around, to bring in and work with the materials to be used for construction. So you're bringing in things like mudslides and that kind of thing. Major concern for me. The point was raised earlier about the 2017 floods, and there was something about nearly a meter above the regular height. I'm on the Bell Park Working Group, and we were getting regular reports on this. So I wanted to see where the flood lines were for the 2017 peak with respect to the site and where the building is going to be. We didn't get that in the report. I think that's a very major omission. Stormwater management as well for the site. You're on heavily sloped property, maybe taking trees down, and water has to flow downhill, right? So I think that's a major concern. It hasn't been really addressed. The planner presented information which led to us believing that only a small percentage of the site footprint is going to actually be used. Well, what is that small percentage? I think that pretty well gets at the points that hadn't been raised as of yet. Um, the other ones I had were repeating points that were made. And I'm, I'm just going to uh, wrap up by saying that I think it's really incumbent upon this committee to take the comments that have been made tonight and the submissions that were made in 2013 by citizens who are going to be voting to support you or not in a municipal election in about a year, really take that to heart for this project. And I'll just say that I'm not against development. An appropriate development on this site could work if it was maybe a quarter or a third the size of what's being proposed. And just in, in terms of comparison, there was an accident at another homestead project recently. It was reported in the media. So I want, I'm going to ask that the comments and the questions be directed to only this application. Well, I'm going to put it in my, my submission, so you can't censor that. It's, it's a matter of record. It was reported in the media. So I'm concerned for the safety of the workers who are going to be working on the project that they work in a safe environment. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to go with um, speaker number 15 and ask speaker number 16 to get set up at the microphone behind me. Welcome. And start with your name and your address. Good evening. My name is Matt Manick. Um, I am at 54 Point St. Mark Drive. Um, we are very new to the community and obviously the city of Kingston as well. Um, we purchased the property uh, coming from a rural community. Um, sim oh, sorry. Um, predominantly for well-being. Um, I think 
you know, we, I think that there have been plenty of comments with regards to why people actually live in that community um, and why everybody's actually purchased a home. And you can actually see the emotion because it's all based on our well-being. And I think all of you, uh, the councillors, I think the, the representatives of the developers, if you actually came out to any one of the homes that are directly impacted um, and actually stood on the back deck or in the bedrooms, I honestly don't think that any of you with good conscience would stand there and actually approve. And the reason for that is that it actually is a detriment to those that are already there. I understand that it actually benefits those um, that obviously, as the gentleman put on uh, facing the west side, they'll have a great view of, uh, of the city and obviously of, um, of the river at the expense of other individuals. And I don't really think that that's what our society is all about, now is it? Our job as a society is to actually make things better for everybody involved. And I think the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what is the best use of this land for everybody's benefit? I think if you actually surveyed not just the community um, directly, but the whole entire city, and you said, you know what, we really want to put something in that benefits the entire community. Let's put in a park. Let's put in a meeting area with a boardwalk, with barbecues and swings. So it's not just there for the direct residents, but basically for anybody that actually wants to come down because it's public property. And you gave them that option and this option. I think all of us in this room, even the representatives, would agree that putting in something that benefits the largest number of citizens and actually puts those at detriment the least that's what we would actually choose. And I think as public officials, that is obviously your role. What is the best use of this land? And I don't think any of us right here tonight would basically say that this is it. Outside of all of the planning issues that we've just discussed and all of the valid points, there are so many other issues associated with this that at the end of the day, deep down inside, ask yourself the one question, is this the best use of our land, our public land? Is it? And who does this actually really benefit? Because at the end of the day, this is the elephant in the room. This benefits the developer. As much as we actually say that there, there are going to be benefits to the community based on boardwalks and so forth, at the end of the day, the number one benefit goes to the developer. Does this benefit the community at large? Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'll go with um, speaker number 16 behind me and then get speaker number 17, who I believe is the last speaker set up at the mic in front of me. Uh, there's a new 17. Good evening. My name is Dean Vogelsang and my family lives at 58 Point St. Mark Drive. I think of all the people that have spoken here so far this evening, um, I'm probably one of uh, those who may be impacted the most, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I'm currently pursuing a, a degree in, in uh, a Master's of Applied Science in Electrical Engineering at the Royal Military College of Canada, with a specialization in radar. So the comments earlier about not on the radar, uh, I know what that means. So when I moved in, I took possession of Mr. James Duquette's house. Um, he gave a very eloquent speech, as I understand, uh, four years ago. And I guarantee tonight I'm not going to say anything uh, that he hasn't already said. Um, but I can tell you that not on the radar is pretty important because despite the fact that it was, it was known that there, were, there was an application, um, it, it wasn't all that well known as a, as, a, as a home buyer, especially a military home buyer who's afforded a mere seven days uh, to make a decision in purchasing a home. Now, I'm only going to be in Kingston for two years. And uh, uh, unlike all those who live uh, with my neighbors, uh, I'm not going to be spending a whole lot of time in the neighborhood. I appreciate the neighborhood. I love it. Wish I could stay longer. But... Um, uh, 
unlike those who are gonna be impacted over a, a lifetime of uh, living in these homes, uh, I'm gonna be impacted over a mere two years. So my family faces devastation financially if, if this goes forward. Um, I'd like to ask the, the council specifically uh, if there is any consideration to the existing uh, uh, residents as to the losses that they're going to face. Uh, it's been mentioned that uh, people uh, are planning on using these homes uh, for retirement, uh, and it's, it's their financial future. Uh, it's my financial future as well, and I'd like to know what City Council uh, has planned. Um, it's been spoken of, uh, and I mean, unfortunately I can't quote the reference, but there was an applicant uh, document which addressed some of the concerns, and uh, I do recall reading it, I'll paraphrase, uh, the existing residents do not own the view. Well, don't we? They've been paid for. They continue to be paid for through uh, municipal taxes. Um, how can it not be considered that, that the existing residents don't have a preference for the views that are there? Don't, aren't they owned? Um, a premium was paid to purchase homes many years ago and more recently. Uh, how can that not be considered? Um, I won't address all of the other uh, concerns that have already been mentioned. Um, I'd just like to have it on public record that I agree with um, all of the other uh, opponents to this application. And uh, I'd like to ask the council itself, is it going to take the stance that's in favor of or in opposition to their wishes of their constituents, the, app, or the uh, citizens of Point St. Mark and the surrounding neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll go with speaker number 17, and I'm reminded that we have a, a, the final speaker will get set up behind me, and it's number 25, Laura Gilren. But I'll start with 17, your name and your street address. Thank you very much. Vicki Schmalka, 702 Newmarket Lane. Mem Madam Chair and members of Planning Committee. Um, much as the applicant tries to describe this as a medium density building, um, it was a monstrosity in 2013, and it's a monstrosity now, not because of its medium density, but because of its location, as people have pointed out. Um, I have a series of questions I'd like to ask just to make sure that we get the specific answers. One is with respect to the bus stop. We have a city policy that people should live within 300 meters of a bus stop. Exactly how far is it between the front door of this building and the bus stop on Highway 15? Um, if it's correct that the roadway is nine, nine meters, uh, the city standard is 20 meters with some possibilities of 18 meters in some developments in usually um, smaller roads in a development with which I don't agree. I prefer 20 meters everywhere. But what is the precedential value when the city allows an, a nine meter right of way to a building or a nine meter access road to a building? Uh, what's going to happen in all those other applications when the developers are always trying to cut back on roadway width as we saw at a development on Gardner's Road and Taylor Kid? Uh, I think there are consequences to that that I'd like to know the answer to. Uh, we've talked about emergency access and fire trucks having trouble turning when they first come down, but if there's an incident at the water on the water side of the property, what is the access to the water side of the property? I'm having trouble with this image that's up there trying to figure out if the shoreline has been changed because all the trees that are showing in that strip do not match the shoreline to the left and to the right. And I'm curious as to whether the 30 meter ribbon of life that is required in our official plan and in fact required by provincial policy has been kind of jerry-rigged by adding, adding earth where there wasn't earth or adding building. It's just an odd looking shoreline. So I'd like the applicant to explain that. And also um, the naturalization doesn't really look like the naturalization that the government provincial government and uh, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry like to see as naturalization. So I would, I would like to know if Parks Canada has agreed to this naturalization as presented here. Also, the pathway looked like it was right along the shoreline, 
and we know that animals need that shoreline. There are a lot of turtles in the Inner Harbor. It's amazing that they are so resilient because the Inner Harbor is extremely polluted, but they are there and they are species at risk. Uh, it's not just painted turtles, which are the only turtle species in Ontario that's not listed as at risk. There are snapping turtles, northern map turtles um, that people have seen regularly uh, through the Inner Harbor system and um, I want to know more about how, how they're being protected with this particular plan and their access. Um, and whether the pathway being so close to the edge is a desirable uh, situation from a natural heritage perspective. Um, there is a Rideau Corridor landscape strategy for the whole Rideau Corridor between the causeway and Ottawa. And this is a strategy that's been adopted by municipalities all along the Rideau system to protect the Rideau system and uh, create a, um, a common way of approaching development along the system. And I would like to know to what extent the city is abrogating its responsibilities to everybody else who's committed to respecting that Rideau Corridor landscape strategy and uh, by, allow, by potentially allowing this. Like, how does this fit within that strategy? Most importantly, how can citizens be assured that city staff and council will not discuss this OMB application behind closed doors and then, for fear of the costs of an OMB hearing, make a deal with the developer that is then presented to the public as a fait accompli without anybody in this room ever having a chance to decide whether they want to go to the OMB as a participant or as a party and fighting this development? Because I think it's been rightly pointed out by a number of people in this room, this is a precedent the, the, we've sacrificed our waterfront at Lake Ontario. This is the beginning of a sacrifice of the waterfront on the Great Cataractway River. And we have an obligation, as has been pointed out very eloquently, not only to the citizens of Kingston and the collective of the citizens of Kingston, we have an obligation to the Rideau Corridor partners and we have an obligation to the world. The UNESCO designation is extremely important. There are only 689 designations in the whole world like this, and we have one. And uniquely, and I meant to look this up, but I didn't, we also have the Frontenac Arch Biosphere Reserve designation, another UNESCO designation. And there are only about, I think it's 20 places in the world that both have a cultural heritage designation like the Rideau Canal one, and a natural heritage designation like the Frontenac Arch one. And this is an enormous tourist potential that has not been tapped at all by, by the city or by the neighbors. There are groups trying to work on it, like the Algonquin to Adirondack Collaborative, but we still haven't really begun to use that potential. And what do we do when we allow a high, you know, a medium rise, seven, eight story building right on the waterfront, right at the beginning of the Rideau Corridor? Um, so I need you to wrap up. I, I've got two more points. So I haven't seen any information about the density per floor area of this building, and I haven't seen specific, Ms. Watson said that it would be allowed to build to 12 meters, but she didn't say what the height actually is. And the, realize, the reason I'm bringing that up is because in any calculation of community benefit, we have to know exactly how much more density and how much more height the developer is getting before we can comment on community benefit. That's the city policy that's evolving. So I feel this whole meeting is, is falsely asking for, for community benefit information from the public when we don't have the, the necessary information from the developer, or at least I haven't seen it with this, in this application. So finally, if I may, and I certainly agree with people, this is not good, this is a bad plan and we shouldn't be sort of adding community benefit to seem to try to make it better, but if it is going to go forward, the community benefit that I would suggest is that the developer provide a piece of property with at least five times the shoreline of this piece of property somewhere along the Rideau Canal between the Causeway and, and Kingston Mills that is set aside for nature as a conserved land with at least a 120 meter buffer. Because what this is doing, we're thinking about it in terms of people and buildings, but it's also destroying the natural heritage of this area. So at the very least, the compensation shouldn't be public art, which I agree we need more of, and, and all the other nice uh, suggestions for community benefits that were listed by staff. We have to get a significant piece of shoreline 
to replace this place that's being ruined. So if I could just look at my notes quickly, I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, everybody in the city is affected by this. I know the neighbors have come to speak because they're the ones who know about it. Most people don't know about it, but I think if people knew about it, they would be here too saying, our waterfront is precious, our waterfront is a rare commodity, our waterfront has already been sacrificed too much, too often, and uh, we should not let this happen. So please respect that the people most affected know about it, other people care about it. Thank you. Thank you. So do we know if that final just begin with your name and your street address, please. Um, I'm Laura Gilron, and I live at 34 Kenwood Circle. I'm a grade 10 pre-IB student at KCVI, and I have lived in the neighborhood surrounding the proposed building my whole life. I was brought home the day after I was born to a house with a backyard directly facing the marina, with a back gate leading straight into the Lands Laneway. Before grade eight, my parents, including number five over there, Kat and I moved about a block. Three years previous, when I was in grade five, I came to City Hall for the first meeting about this building and spoke about why I disapproved of the proposal. I still disapprove, and here's why. The wildlife of our neighborhood would be negatively impacted. The building would not be very fruitful or convenient. Traffic caused by the building would be dangerous, and the environment would be harmed. I don't have any questions tonight. Well, I have a lot of questions, but I only have five minutes, so I can't get them all in. To begin, when I was really small, there was a family of foxes by the marina where the apartment building would go. My dad and I often looked at them from a distance because they were so cool. But then, like a betrayal of loss of innocence in a coming of age story, the creatures disappeared. I still wonder what happened to those poor things and it raises an important question. What would happen to the other creatures in our neighborhood should the construction go ahead? Secondly, there are four apartment buildings owned by Homestead that Google Maps says are 1, 1.4, 1, and 1.4 kilometers away from the proposed location, but are closer to schools and downtown, and there are still apartments available in each building. If Homestead constructed another apartment building, they'd likely stick with the same unit layouts, since most of the available apartments in their buildings are different combinations of one to two bedrooms and bathrooms, plus or minus a den. Believe me, I checked on their website last night at 1.20. Have I mentioned I'm determined? This raises the question of why we need more apartment buildings. There are buildings in more convenient locations in our area, and they all have available space. So if I were interested in an apartment in the area, I would rather an apartment in one of those than the one we're discussing. How could this building disrupt our neighborhood, you ask? The third reason I don't believe this is suitable for our neighborhood is because of traffic. We're fortunate to have quieter streets, so it's safer for our kids. Some people have basketball nets out and play on the road. Once my basketball was run over and I was sad about the basketball, my parents were worried for my safety. Imagine how much busier and more dangerous these roads would get with 95 more families in the area, especially since there's only one exit that would be in high demand every morning, which isn't good for all those just trying to get to school or work. Like the multiple doctors who are required to be at the hospital in 20 minutes or less so that they can save people's lives. The congestion on these streets could cost human lives in Kingston in more ways than one. This risk to the citizens is not something I deem to be negotiable. In addition, the one laneway leading to the proposed location is insufficient. Many collisions could be caused by vehicles heading out of the buildings and others heading in. Not to mention the fact that in case of a fire, there would, be, there would need to be many directions to escape in. Years ago, the marina was set ablaze by a raccoon chewing wires and the houses lining it were evacuated, including, including my own. Ash even fell a few streets over. If something like this were to happen, people would have difficulties leaving due to the congestion. Such a dreadful and easily avoidable event should not be allowed to occur. So not only does this building cause inconveniences for our population, and like it can, just, it can hurt people, and that's not something that we should risk. Finally, the environment is very important to Kingston. But constructing a new apartment building would not be good for the environment for many reasons. For one, the construction of this building would create lots of waste and operating machinery would negatively affect the environment with pollution. Plus, the building would have 95 units worth of heating, power, and water working all year long, which uses a lot of energy that could be better used, especially since all of these apartments would not be inhabited due to the other more convenient buildings. So it will waste energy. We should consider the environment when we ask ourselves if, if this building is in any way helpful. So, 
threat to our wildlife, our environment, to the population of our neighborhood, to the patients who are being treated by the people in our neighborhood, and not a very convenient place to build a building in the first place. Do we still really think that the view is worth it? Thank you. Thank you. So we'll go to, we had one uh, additional speaker, and then we're, I'm going to go to some questions that I have on my list. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Gavin Anderson. I live at 702 Newmarket Lane. Uh, I have a, a procedural question. I guess I'll direct it to the, the chair of the planning committee, um, Councillor Shell, and that is um, I understand, learned this evening that uh, there's going to be an OMB pre-hearing on November 22nd. And my question is, um, w will the city be represented at that meeting? Uh, by whom and with what mandate? Um, uh, it's clear that, the, that uh, without exception, the speakers here are, are advocating for the city to take a position in opposition to Homestead and their application. Um, but perhaps you could explain to, to me and others here, what is the role of uh, the, the planning department, the, the planning committee, and council uh, between now and the 22nd? And would our uh, a failure to, to take a position, particularly a position in uh, opposition to this application, does that in any way compromise us when we're going up against the developer who will quite clearly appear on November 22nd, well represented by council, uh, with, with a line of experts that are prepared to counter every argument that's been made here tonight. Uh, so in, in essence, my question is a procedural one. What is going to happen from, uh, from this moment forward, particularly between now and the 22nd, and what are the city's options going forward? Bearing in mind that in, once it is in the OMB, the, the, city, the city does have the opportunity to, uh, to negotiate with the applicant uh, in a process, as a previous speaker has said, is, um, is not in the public domain. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to work through the questions, including that last one, but in the order that I think I heard them. And the first question that I have for on the list that I heard for city staff was, has, this, has the city reestablished the 100-year flood line in light of the flooding that's occurred recently? Through you, Madam Chair, staff are working with the Conservation Authority with respect to the review of the applications. That's something that we will have to um, do some further review with the Conservation Authority regarding. So we don't have, there, there is an elevation established by the Conservation Authority and in terms of where the floodplain is. There have been no questions with respect to what that elevation is. It's as established, I believe it's 76.9. Um, the Conservation Authority hasn't asked for a higher floodplain elevation because of the flooding that happened in the springtime. A question for the applicant's representative. Is there barrier-free parking? Yes, there is. Uh, there'll be both barrier-free parking on grade and also underground parking. Uh, um, by the same token, the building meets all the Ontario Building Code requirements for accessibility in terms of the mix of units which need to be wheelchair accessible and any other requirements for access to swimming pools or um, uh, amenity areas. Thank you. A couple of questions about the boat ramp. Is the boat ramp in the same location as I guess currently exists or is it being shifted and then how um, would boats, how would cars and trailers be accommodated? on the site. The, the, right now, there's a quite a, a major boat slip down there. <clears throat> uh, there's a big travel lift for get, getting large boats in the water. We're not talking about anything like that. This is for the launching of canoes and kayaks and small pleasure craft. Uh, any large boats would ha still have to be put in at uh, Portsmouth and Olympic Harbor, for instance, or where there's large facilities for those types of boats. Um, so this would be, um, the, what is shown is on the left corner of the site, uh, that there's a path heading down to the water, that is where the launching ramp would be. Uh, so we see boats being carried down there. The Conservation Authority, as well as the emergency, uh, the fire department, do not want us to have vehicles down on the water. Um, they really want to keep that, uh, uh, that green uh, ribbon of life uh, intact. And so it's really just people carrying boats down there. 
Uh, the <clears throat> and that can be from the neighborhood or from the parking lot. Uh, it could also be uh, launched, I suppose, from the, the park to the north uh, in, the, in the same manner. So it's, it's that type of watercraft. And I heard, again, questions about how, uh, emer how access and, in particular, emergency access works. So I'm not sure if you are prepared to answer yeah, that. Yeah, we, we had, um, early on, we had discussed with the fire department about taking, uh, getting an emergency route across that park. That's, that's, I think, about five years ago. They were not interested in that, and we weren't, didn't really want to do that either. And I think there's, as you can see tonight, any kind of vehicles moving through there would, be, would not be a good idea. So our discussion with the fire department has been to use that nine meter wide uh, laneway access uh, to the site. Uh, the minimum width of that, that access for two-way uh, two traffic is 6.4 meters, so we are we're much wider than we need to be. And we, the uh, fire trucks, you can see there's a, a turnaround as they come into the site. Uh, they would not uh, you, they'd be able to do the 18 meter turning radius to be able to park near the front entrance of the building. And of course, any building of this size needs to be sprinklered so, and it's non-combustible construction. Uh, so the, um, uh, there's, no, there's no danger of the, the type of fire which in, uh, affected one of those, uh, those boat sheds a few years back. Um, a question to staff, uh, whether um, the 2013 presentations by residents have been made available to council. Through you, Madam Chair, um, all of the presentations from the 2013 public meeting are within the public record, and a summary of all of those details will be provided when a report is brought back to council to seek further direction. So they're all still a matter of public record. Uh, I think this question was asked before, but I'll ask staff to um, provide a brief answer. Whether there's been a response to the 2013 Homestead reports. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, the second submission of the application is, in effect, the response to the 2013 technical response comments that were provided to the applicant by staff. So that is what is in front of us now for review, and that is what we will be seeking direction from council from following the meeting this evening. Has staff been asked to look at other options for the property? Through you, Madam Chair, the application that is in front of us is what staff are reviewing. Staff have not taken a position on the application and are still reviewing the matter. We are also having peer reviews conducted on the information that has been submitted to us and will be reporting back to council with a reporting camera to seek direction prior to the pre-hearing on November 22nd. A question for the applicant's representatives. Do you know what the um, percentage the, the percentage of the parcel size that the building footprint takes up. Do you have that statistic? Well, we don't have that with us, but certainly we can provide that. Okay. A question for either the applicant's representative, well, I guess it's for the applicant's representative, more, um, a more precise response with respect to the distance to the bus stop on Highway 15 from this parcel. Again, that's information that we could measure and provide back. And for the city, does this, um, the dimension of the driveway for access to this property, does this establish a precedent in Kingston that will be used elsewhere? Through you, Madam Chair, uh, with respect to the access point being a nine meter wide driveway to the site as opposed to a municipal road, um, staff have indicated some concerns with respect to the volumes of traffic that may be coming and going through here as well as um, combining vehicular access and pedestrian access. We're having the access component looked at by a peer reviewer for a technical review of access to and from the site and so that component is still under review and we're seeking further clarification regarding that. Question for the um, applicant, the developers' um, representatives. Do you have any information? Can you clarify the condition, the brownfield uh, condition of the property? 
I can confirm that um, there is some, um, I can't go so far as to say contamination, but because boats have been stored on the site and repaired there, that there will have to be some cleanup on the site, but that the applicant at this point uh, is not considering this a brownfields application site, that they recognize it has to be cleaned up, but that's part of the development cost. There was a question about the um, representation of the shoreline in the diagram that's on the screen, whether uh, there's been any modifications to the shoreline in these illustrations or that's a representation of existing conditions. So that's actually a representation of existing conditions. Um, the reason that it juts out that way is because the existing property um, as the marina was filled so it's been filled and been filled for many, many years. So actually, um, this is going back to a more naturalized state. So uh, right now, it's, it's a mixture of concrete. It's hard surfaces. There's no growth there. So what will happen is we're actually creating a ribbon of life on this property where there isn't one now. So um, if we went back to the photograph of the site taken from the water, so you do get that perspective of the site taken from the water, you'll see that it is a hard concrete surface. The shoreline is, is, is all hard concrete. It's not natural. And this would actually bring it back. A question to the city, I think, of whether Parks Canada agrees with the uh, naturalization, I guess, the naturalization slash landscape plan. Through you, Madam Chair, the application has been circulated to Parks Canada for review and comment. Um, with respect to the naturalization, that is a, a goal that they want to achieve with respect to a naturalized view of the corridor. Um, they have uh, indicated some concerns with respect to scale. I don't believe there's specific comments with respect to the nature of the naturalization. And a question about the, um, the effect of the, well, let's, I think I'm gonna phrase it, around that, the ribbon of life and whether the path will have an effect on the integrity of that and also maybe while you're responding to that, talk about how turtles are being protected in this area. So, so we'll deal I, with it. Yeah, uh, sorry, I would go back to again that right now this is hard surfaces, gravel, pavement, old pavement, and that will actually be removed and replaced by soil. And um, the landscape plan has been done by Scott Wentworth, who is very well known. Um, and what he's using is a mixture of trees that are native to the area, and the plan is not to put them in in a straight line, but actually to have them um, mixed up in the site so that you have different trees intermixed with each other, so that it'll actually look more like the shoreline elsewhere along the canal. Um, so in terms of, um, I know I lost my train of thought a little bit on the question there, but I know you did ask about turtles. Um, his report doesn't specifically deal with that. Uh, what the Conservation Authority in their original comments noted um, that the site didn't require an environmental impact statement, that it wasn't necessary for this site. Question for the city about how um, this proposal the relation of this proposal to the Redor Corridor's landscape strategy. Thank you, and through you. So as part of the technical review, that's one of the elements that we're looking at, as well as the UNESCO World Heritage um, guidelines and statements and policies. So that's part of the detailed um, review and work that we've been doing with Parks Canada um, it started in 2013. It obviously resumed again once we had a resubmission earlier this year, and those are detailed discussions that are still ongoing. And the final question on my list is, uh, will the city be represented at the OMB? Uh, what's the mandate? What happens between now and then? And sorry, there's a bundle of questions in this question. And then what are the city's options? So. The first question, the first part of the question, will the CD be represented at the OMB and, and by what and with what mandate? By whom and with what mandate? Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, 
yes, the city will be represented at the OMB hearing. Um, with respect to what position the city will be taking, that hasn't been determined as of yet. As I indicated in my previous responses, staff are gathering all of the public input that's received this evening, together with undertaking peer reviews of the heritage impact assessment, as well as doing a functional peer review with respect to the access to the site, which also does include emergency vehicle access. So those components are under review. Staff will be providing a report to council outlining the components of the technical review to date and seeking direction from council with respect to how to proceed as it relates to the Ontario Municipal Board hearing. At the pre-hearing on November 22nd, it is not the hearing, it is a pre-hearing, and so in terms of what components are to be discussed at that time, I, I certainly am not in a position to be able to outline all of the details at that given that there hasn't been direction provided to date. However, that's also an opportunity where if there are members of the public that choose to be participants, um, that would be an opportunity for them to make that known or they could contact the OMB directly in advance of the hearing on November 22nd and in addition to that. And I think part of the question was who represents the city at the OMB? Thank you, and through you, Madam Chair. So the city has retained external legal, legal counsel related to this appeal um, since it was filed. So that legal counsel works alongside city staff and will be part of the in-camera briefing when the report goes to council as part of a litigative matter. So there is an external counsel that has been retained. It's um, Tony Fleming. That's the end of my list of questions. Um, I'd like to give the uh, public one more opportunity if there's someone who hasn't spoken and, and really would like to add something to uh, tonight's discussion. This, this will be your chance. Um, yes, sir. If you'd like to come to a microphone, either this side or this. Well, yes. Yeah, you do. <laughs> this is all being taped as well. <laughs> Okay, so I have a question for City Council, and... Um, sorry, sir, we need your oh, name Oh, I'm sorry, address. it's Brian Mayfield. I live on 908 Ambleside Crescent. And my question is unusual because the answer is either yes or no. And my question is, if you, if you lived in one of those houses, would you be opposed to this building being built in this location? Thank you. Any other speakers? You have, to, you have to go to the microphone and give your name and street address. With regard to the plan that was submitted to the uh, DASH on the DASH site, I was informed that they were going to be bringing a, a specific detailed change in the floor plan of the building to, to tell us and clarify how they're gonna get 95 units within a seven floor building that has six floors actually, but the top floor is a, but how they were gonna do that. And I'm just wondering, are they gonna provide that right now today or do they not have it? In your name and address, street address. It's Arnold Gadet, 52 Point St. Mark Drive. Thank you. So maybe we'll end with that uh, question. Are there any details on the floor plans? I think the question is something to do with how many units on each floor. Yeah. I'm <clears throat> sorry, sorry, the quest your, okay. your questions go to the committee okay. and then I translate the questions to yeah. the, the staff or yeah, applicants' representatives. I'm afraid I'm, I, I'm not sure what's on the dash right, itself right now. Um, we, we're aiming for 95 units uh, in that, within that uh, envelope. If we can't get 95 units, it'll be less than 95 units. But we will give you a, a revised drawings as soon as you have those. 
Sorry, can't, I can't have any conversation between you and the applicant's representative. Your questions go to the committee and then we translate it and that's the response they've given. Okay, so I'll ask, uh, anything else in your presentation in your five minute allotment? the dash site, uh, it runs along, runs across the, the main entrance to the property that services the entire property. Is there an emergency plan that's set up? What if, there are, what if the sewage system goes down and have to cut across the main entrance, which is only 29 or 9 meters or whatever? Is there a plan? Is, I don't know. Like, how do you plan on addressing that issue if something happens in the future? How do you address that safety aspect of evacuating those people or getting an ambulance down or getting those things? Thank you. So I hear two questions. One for city staff, how um, you accept the application without details on the number of units per floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, um, in discussions with the applicant, we understand that although the height has been dropped um, by a story to seven stories, there's still the intent um, to apply for zoning that would permit 95 units. The floor plans can um, be modified over time um, due to um, changes in terms of the applicant's intent over one bedroom units versus two bedroom units, but the application before staff um, is a request for 95 units, a density of five, 95 units for the site. And then the final question about the site services, what happens if there are issues and it affects the access on the main driveway? What's the plan? So, and you're talking about um, servicing as in water and sewer? Is that correct? <coughs> yeah, it was. Uh, so the, um, when, uh, at this stage of the game, an engineer provides a serviceability study, and that shows that um, there is capacity to accommodate a development like this. Once you get to a further stage of site plan and building permit, um, then detailed engineering drawings are submitted and they are reviewed by the city's uh, utilities, Kingston, and their engineering staff. So professional engineers are reviewing these and ensuring the appropriate standards are in place. Okay. Um, seeing no other people who wish to speak, I'm going to ask the committee uh, if they have further questions on this file. Councillor Neal. Yes, in response to the gentleman that said and I don't want this to sound flippant, but what would we do if we were living in one of those houses? We would recuse ourselves. We would not be allowed by law to, to vote either here or at council. Uh, so, uh, and, and the other thing is, I almost said for the first time in 13 years of being a councillor, point of personal privilege at a public meeting. A couple of people suggested that council has already made up their mind and this committee has already made up their mind. I can assure you I'm on no developer's Christmas list. I will make whatever judgment I make as we, as we must as a quasi-judicial board based on planning, the Planning Act, zoning, and our official plan. And those are the only criteria we're allowed to, to use. Uh, so the idea that somehow uh, the homestead has already reached out to us and we've, and this is already decided, I can assure you is not the case. So uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm still trying to get my head around 
how the process, because we're both caught up in an OMB process, but at the same time we're trying our best to follow our own planning uh, criteria. So perhaps you could explain better. I don't want to be in this in a position where either we as a committee or council might end up saying no to this development and then we're told that vote doesn't count because it's in the hands of the OMB. That's happened at one other development recently. So can you walk, kind of walk me through how the OMB will impact our process? Thank you, and through you, I'm going to do my best. Um, I wish Tony Fleming was here. I've thought that about 25 times in the last half an hour because he's the lawyer and I'm the planner, so I'll do my best. Um, this is a unique situation. It's one where um, our normal process, to some extent, has been circumvented by the appeal of the application. So normally, we would be going through and doing our technical review. We would be looking at the peer review. So that part is still the same. The part that's different is that we no longer are able to bring a comprehensive report with a staff recommendation to this group in open session, which then goes on to council for a final decision. Because this matter has been appealed and the final decision on this will be made by the Ontario Municipal Board, what position we have now as a city is to look at the information, go to council, have council provide us direction as to how they want to represent this issue on the city's behalf at the hearing. We don't know what that is yet because we haven't had that meeting and staff have been working as fast as we can to try to get that work done, to have that discussion with you before the pre-hearing on November 22nd and we were given a very short period of time to do that. So I know it's not the, the best answer, but it's the best one I can give you right now. There are a lot of unknowns, but that's essentially the process ahead. Based on the direction that council provides to us as we want you to go in and support this project, we want you um, to not support this project and then go through a hearing process. The city on either side would present its side of it, as does the developer. The OMB considers all of that information, and then they would provide a written decision based on whatever they think makes sense from a land use planning perspective. And kind of trying to get my head around the legalities and the way things have worked out in the past, we could, <clears throat> it would be unfortunate but possible that council could, in camera, say that we aren't supporting, uh, that we are supporting the application or we aren't willing to defend a decision. And that, does that take away everybody's right to appeal to the OMB? Would the OMB then just make their judgment based on, on an in-camera decision of council? Through you, Madam Chair, um, irrespective of the position that council takes, because we don't know what that's going to be at this point in time, the public always has the opportunity to be a participant or a party to the hearing and could establish a status at the hearing going forward or at the pre-hearing going forward. So there's still opportunities for that to occur. We can determine the process better going forward once there's an opportunity for council to provide some direction. So regardless of our pre-hearing uh, uh, in-camera discussion by council, we will, whatever that decision is, we will not be taking away anybody's right of appeal to the OMB. Through you, Madam Chair, I don't believe so. However, I would seek further clarification from our legal counsel when we do have that discussion. Great, thank you, I'd appreciate that. My final comment, and I've made this before, has to do with community benefit. I know that we say, and rightfully, that community benefit should only apply to, uh, to uh, sound uh, planning proposal. But by putting, by front ending it like we do, it really does feel to a lot of people in the public 
and to me at times, that this is a bit of a let's make a deal to, uh, issue that's going on. Like if there's enough community benefit, this will get through. Now I know that isn't the intention of the process, but that's the perception of the process. Perhaps you could comment on that. Sure, thank you, and through you, Madam Chair. So I understand that there is, and, and I read the Toronto Star, and I read the Globe, and I read a lot of the, the media that's been out there talking about cities that make deals. And I know that there's been discussion about that here. I would say the unfortunate thing about that is, is the origin of that comes from the way the legislation has been written and the way the, the legislation has to be implemented in that community benefits have to be implemented through the zoning bylaw that's passed to support a project. So it does give the impression, because you have to have those discussions very early in the process before staff have often even determined a position on a proposal, that's the way the legislation is, and that's the way we have to engage in the conversations. In this case, the reason why we're having the conversation, even though the matter is going to be before the board, is that we didn't want to, as a city, forfeit our opportunity to have a discussion about community benefits and present any of that information to the board should they decide to approve some type of project. So we need to have a discussion so that we have a position or we would potentially forfeit our ability to have that at all because the matter is now before the board. As I understand it, the Planning Act talks about uh, there being neighborhood input on community benefit. I guess the problem is by doing it the way we're doing it now is uh, the community, I didn't hear a whole lot of discussion of community benefit to, today because people aren't focused on that. If, if a comprehensive report came forward with a recommendation, I'm not saying it will, but if it did, wouldn't that be the appropriate time to consult with the community rather than having 25 people saying, no, we don't want this to happen, nobody talking about community benefit, so by default it becomes a staff-driven process. Um, yeah, I understand your perspective on that, and I think the work that we're doing right now is looking at our process for community benefits. We've had it established in policy in the official plan, I think since 2010, we have engaged in very few discussions on developments related to community benefits, uh, probably two, maybe three. And it's something that we're trying to wrap our minds around as staff, how to do it in a meaningful way, knowing that the legislation gives us a certain order of doing things. And that's why we've developed our own comprehensive guidelines. So we're finishing that document now. We've done a lot of um, public engagement related to it. And we will be bringing that back to this committee sometime in the near future, but we can certainly contemplate some of your suggestions about appropriate timing. But there are requirements um, in and around statutory consultation, and when that happens, and the process is typically at the beginning unless there's multiple public meetings, so logistically it presents some challenges, but your, your point is made. Thank you, and you know I've never opposed the idea of multiple public meetings. Thank you. Other questions from the committee? No, I would, I would like to reiterate that I, I was a bit offended um, to hear that uh, someone thinks that we have been meeting with the uh, uh, proponent and have made up our minds because as far as I know, that has not happened. Um, I'm sorry, I'm making a statement um, point of personal privilege, as um, Councillor Neal mentioned as well, and it was just um, a, a somewhat of an accusation was made, and I'm responding, which I have the right to. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, Mr. Anderson, um, this is now a legal matter, as we all know, and uh, the process that continues now will be council and staff, not the planning committee, since this is under an OMB hearing. And November 22nd, I'm presuming it will be here. Uh, that's the day that there will be a pre-hearing on this matter. And um, you mentioned oh, the OMB itself. Is this 
would people get in touch with the OMB through the planner or through the website, which would be right? Through you, Madam Chair, the um, case would be directly listed on the OMB website if you go into Kingston to look at active appeals, and the details of the pre-hearing would be there. Um, there's the opportunity to contact the caseworker directly to ask to be listed as a participant or to come that day of the pre-hearing. So people could actually get on the OMB website and list themselves in advance of November 22nd as a participant. So uh, I urge all of you who are interested to, uh, to do that so that you can stay involved in this. But the process is uh, somewhat out of city's hands. Uh, it's now a legal process with the Ontario Municipal Board, which is why we will be hiring a lawyer, as mentioned, to represent the city. Uh, any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, uh, I will now close this public meeting. And thank you all very much for your participation on this very, very difficult issue. Let's take a five minute recess while, while the room uh, Clears. Thank you. Hey, thank you. I'll call the regular planning committee meeting to order and uh, ask for approval of the agenda with the uh, edits that we received this evening. Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Osanek. All those in favor, thank you. And uh, confirmation of the minutes of October the 5th. Moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor Holland. All those in favor, and that's carried. Thank you. Disclosures of pecuniary interest, none. Um, now we do have someone who would like to make a delegation, I understand. Okay, there we go. Um, now we, we have um, an order of business that is uh, King Street uh, West, King Street East, and then uh, Montreal Street. So uh, I would like to know if you would like to give your delegation now or right before? Well, now would be great. So I will just make a, uh, ask for a motion to have moved by Councillor Holland, seconded by Councillor Osanek, uh, that we waive the bylaws for a delegation from Ms. Clifford. All those in favor? Carried. So please come ahead. You have five minutes. Um, right probably right there. Yeah, thanks. And this is concerning? Um, yeah, Montreal Street. Thank, Thank you. you very much for hearing me. I know you've had a long evening and you must be sweltering. Um, first, I'd like to say thanks to city planning staff. I'm very new to planning. My background is in family law. This has been a real eye-opener for me. Um, and this, as you all know, I'm sure this file became somewhat complex. So uh, I speak to my neighbors quite frequently. And although I you know, have spoken with them and I'm the only one here, these are my own views. Um, first, I'd really like to commend city staff and the planning committee for recommending the extended uses option of this space. The neighborhood, to my understanding, is totally behind it. We're really behind the applicant finding an appropriate tenant, and we think that this extension of use will move towards that. Um, we are concerned, we remain concerned, um, about two things. One is that to have a hold symbol on just the front portion of the property for a year, well, it's a great idea. It, it might limit a potential commercial tenant who could be really terrific, and especially since the uses are being extended to things that include yoga studios and doctor's offices that tend to take up a bit more room than just a little kind of, I don't know, like corner store that sells gum, that we'd really encourage that if the planning committee chooses to pursue the whole symbol, that it be extended to the entire ground floor. Um, so that's my first point. And my second point is that I, uh, um, I pursued a, you know, just some introductory research into what an adverse effect is. And when I look at the 2010 um, official plan, I see that it's a non-exhaustive list. It means here are some things to consider, but there could be more things. There could be more adverse effects. And so while well, city staff you know, aptly dealt with community comments in the community comment section of the report, 
I really think it would be important to look at the loss of the commercial space as an effect. I understand it's in a residential area, but I think we're all aware that the effect of passing this um, ZBA as it stands would be to lose the commercial space. Um, that, that this effect could potentially be detrimental to our neighborhood. And so I would encourage the planning committee to just do whatever you can to just pursue that more. Like I did a little bit of preliminary OMB research. It looks like it's a really wide open question. Um, of course, there's the NKT report, which wouldn't be binding legislation on this file. We all know that. It's not the governing framework. Perhaps it would provide some enlightenment to what the neighborhood needs. Um, but I do think it would be wonderful to see the potential loss of commercial space explored more thoroughly as an adverse effect, which is dictated by the 2010 OP. So that's it. You guys must be hot and tired, and thank you very much for listening to me this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you with that. Oh, um, did you, sorry, did do you want to speak in delegation? I guess we'll waive the bylaw again. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Holland, seconded by Councillor Turner uh, to permit um, <laughs> more, one more delegation on the Montreal Street. Thank you. All those in favor, thank you. Hello? Okay. Since I've never spoken from here before. Um, thank you. My name is Jennifer Guerra. I'm a planner with Foten Consultants, and I've been representing the applicant through this zoning bylaw amendment process. And there's just a few items I would like to re-emphasize as I discussed in the public meeting and also as staff have um, emphasized and reiterated in much of the correspondence back and forth with members of the community that we've had an opportunity to read. And first I'd just like to say that when we assess the appropriateness of a zoning bylaw amendment, particularly with respect to use, one of the main, main things that we do is we look to the official plan for broader context on what we'd like to see on sites. And when we look at the official plan, both the 2010 plan and the 2017 plan, which was just approved in August, is that this site is residentially designated and it's within a housing district. And the primary uses intended for these sites is for residential use. The OP also contemplates there may be situations where commercial development is appropriate as assessed on a site-by-site -site basis, but there certainly isn't a case where we would see commercial required in a residential designation. In fact, that might be contrary to what those policies say. Um, I'd also like to emphasize that today, as of right, in the current zoning, the whole building could be 100% residential. The current zoning does not require commercial. So the question really before the committee tonight is not whether or not it's inappropriate to not have commercial on the ground floor because currently it's not required to have commercial on the ground floor. The question is whether it's appropriate to intensify to four residential units. And that's what this zoning is about. It's a residential intensification. We're actually broadening the list of commercial uses that are permitted um, but we're certainly not taking it away. And I think uh, my opinion and, and staff have agreed in their report that uh, this is an appropriate zoning bylaw amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we don't... Pardon me? Questions and delegation are allowed. Of the delegate? Yep. Yep. Okay. Two Councilor, questions. Two questions. Thank you. Councilor Neal. Um, I appreciate that you have by right zoning uh, abilities. I guess what we're trying to respond to, and the hold, I think, does in part respond to, is the fact that the community, the immediate neighborhood, definitely would like to see what has been there for, for years and years, which is commercial. A, some kind of commercial application. 
And I know that we're going by existing zoning, and I appreciate that. I guess, uh, but the reality is that probably, without second guessing, we have a secondary plan that may come back to talk about greater commercial space. So I'm thankful that your uh, that the owner is continuing to respect that potential for de space. I'm curious whether, th uh, and this may be a question for staff when we get to this part in the agenda, but do you foresee there being any additional, uh, additional commercial uses? In other words, if I came to you with a commercial uh, use, and it wasn't on that very narrow prescribed list, would you willingly come back to our planning department? And the question I'll ask planning later, because we can't ask them questions during delegation, but I'll ask them later whether indeed there would be an opportunity to broaden that list in order to achieve uh, the commercial use that the neighborhood clearly would prefer. Uh, thank you, and through you, Madam Chair. Um, I think, uh, and I hope what you'll find in the revised zoning that's before you this evening, which is considerably different than what was brought forward at the public meeting a month or so ago, is an expanded list of commercial uses. Um, one of the big comments we heard from the community is it would be it would be great if we could have office or you know clinic uses and we actually went back with staff and sat down and discussed what could this site which keep in mind was purpose built residential initially most likely it was converted to commercial at some point in the 70s so we have to keep in mind that it is constrained in that it was originally purpose built for residential what can we reasonably fit on this site, given its constraints, given its size, given the fact that it only has two parking spaces? So the zoning that's before you tonight is actually quite comprehensive in terms of the commercial uses that would be permitted. It would permit all of those commercial uh, neighborhood commercial uses. Um, recreational use has been added that would allow for yoga studios. Um, you know, Tai Chi studios. It would allow for dance groups to occupy the space. We're uh, proposing uh, half the ground floor could accommodate office or clinic. Um, so th uses like chiropractors, massage therapists. We, through discussions with staff, determined there simply isn't enough parking to, to support full ground floor office or full ground floor uh, clinic. And so I think what the zoning before you tonight uh, includes is the most intense form of potential commercial uses that this site can accommodate. Anything more, I don't think could be supported by the parking. And uh, sorry, one more thing. Um, the fact that we're applying a hold to the site that would not allow commercial or residential development in the front of that ground floor for up to a year. Um, the owner's already been looking for a commercial tenant for a year from now. So it, it's been a two-year commitment to look for a commercial tenant. And hopefully this extended list of uses will will secure someone. That's the hope. That's that's the, the genuine hope from the owner. And I genuinely hope you're successful. Thank you. In finding a commercial tenant. Thank you. Other questions from the committee or our visiting councillor? Yep. No, I think uh, Councillor Neal covered it, and um, okay, and the, and the report does as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. No other delegations. We will now um, come to business item A. Uh, 783 King Street West, which was um, subject of a public meeting a few months ago and has a comprehensive report with a recommendation. Can I have a mover? Moved by Councillor Turner, seconded by Councillor Osanic. Comments? All those in favor? And that carries, thank you. Um, and B is uh, 
303 Concession Street, Transeastern Communications. This was for a zoning bylaw amendment. Moved by Councillor Turner, seconded by Councillor Neal. Comments or questions? All those in favor? And that carries, thank you. And C is uh, 225 King Street East, official plan uh, zoning bylaw amendment for the um, Frontenac Club. Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Holland. All those in favor? And that carries, thank you. And uh, D, that was the subject of the delegation. 306, 308 Montreal Street, uh, zoning bylaw amendment. Shall we get it on the floor? Or would you like to ask any questions of staff first? Councillor Neal? Uh, the question I asked earlier, I know it's a much more comprehensive list of potential uses and I really appreciate the work you've done on that. But if somebody came in with a kind of unique uh, kind of request, I'm thinking, uh, I, I, I believe a greengrocer would be allowed. Is that accurate? Uh, somebody, uh, somebody who wants to sell Vegetables, green grocers like we have in big cities in heavily residential areas. Through you, Ms. Madam Dedrickson. Chair, um, I think that a food store or a, a general store would likely cover that type of use. Thank you. I should have looked behind me. Uh, I know from being on the Arts Advisory Committee, the one area that we have a huge gap in in the arts is um, a public gallery space, uh, whether it's a public gallery or, or a private gallery, would that fit within the, uh, within the designated or potential uses? Sorry, I should have given you these questions before. Through you, Madam Chair, there is a permission for a live-work unit in the zoning bylaw, which uh, in association with an, with an art gallery. Um, so it would be a... And it could be a combined studio and... Uh, artisan space. studio, art gallery. Okay. Yes. I guess it's up to us to convince somebody uh, to, to find a good use for that that falls within that fairly broad list of, of potential commercial uses, and I hope that happens. Thank you. We have a recommendation from staff. Shall we put it on the floor? Councillor Turner, seconded by Councillor Osanic. Um, uh, Councillor Holland, questions? Um, no, I, I don't have any questions. I guess I just wanted to um, reiterate something that uh, my colleague mentioned earlier regarding the pending North Kingstown plan. Uh, and something I think I, I said when we spoke on this the last time, uh, which is that I know that the timing is sort of unfortunate. First of all, very appreciative that the um, that staff and the, the property owner have worked together and have put together what looks like a very hopeful solution to the concerns that people in the neighborhood have. Um, but I think just thinking more broadly, it was in fact um, part of our strategic plan and a goal of council to have commercial development along Montreal Street. And so um, while that's not binding in the planning process, I, re I recognize that, I do hope that the spirit of that uh, prevails somehow. Thank you very much. Okay, would you like to comment, Councillor Hutchison? Yes, we can ask questions of staff. Okay, oh, well, just referencing um, Councillor Holmes remark there, um, just to make this perhaps just clear, is that the, um, the, the developer, the applicant, um, has volunteered the holding symbol as it applies, right? and the applicant does not have to do that, right? Um, so I'm thankful for that, that. That's a step in the right direction. 
the um, the Kings, there's a lot of talk about the North Kingstown secondary plan, which I believe is like a year away from being even presented. Is that correct? Um, we're just getting ready to bring a report to council for the award of that right. contract in the next month. Okay, because in one of the emails I read, it, it seemed to indicate that it would be a year. But it, it actually, that accords more with my memory, but I thought I read that. We're just getting ready to award the contract and then the work itself will be about 12 months from that point in time, maybe a little bit more. And before that became um, applicable to um, situations such as this, that would be, I mean, it has to, it has to be passed, then the zoning has to be changed. And so before the North Town North Kingstown secondary plan becomes applicable, how long would that probably be? I'm hope hopefully speculating 18 months, barring any appeals. 18 months from the time of report. And my understanding is that even so, if the, if the developer or the applicant has made um, the application several months ago to make these changes, the, the secondary, the, 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 NK, the North Kingstown secondary plan would not apply because it's not law at this point in time. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, got a couple of technical questions here that I just want to be clear about. And that is on page 124, at the very bottom, it says that it's giving the rationale for the recommendation, or it's one of a number of rationales. And um, the proposed residential, second sentence, the proposed residential density and potential conversion of the ground floor to two dwelling units is consistent with the strategic policy direction related to the direction of residential growth where it can be accommodated. I'm not sure what that means. Um, I th does, is that just another way of saying it's in line with the existing zoning? Or is there something more there? Through you, Madam Chair, that's a way of stating that uh, the proposed zoning amendment is consistent with the policy direction of the official plan. Of the official plan and the zoning that exists and so on. That's what I thought, but didn't quite say that. But I got it, okay. Um, let's see, I asked about the holding. Pretty much, um, I mean, this is a difficult file because they have the, what the, the neighborhood, what the neighborhood is saying is not inconsistent with what our general movement in the official plan over the last 10 years that I've been around. And it's understandable that people would say that and that those desires are there. Um, there are certain elements that can't be taken into account because of the framework in which the decision has to be made. That's what I was trying to just indicate there earlier. So um, we can see that here when you're talking about the consistent with the strategic, pol strategic policy direction to encourage a mix of land uses, and yet this situation is allowing the <laughs> commercial, in the view of some, is allowing commercial to disappear, right? Which cuts down on mixed use. So we're sort of going, and maybe this is just where the city is at right now, we're going two ways at once. Um, if you just follow what you've got there. I'm not saying it's incoherent. I do understand what you're saying, but I'm just pointing out the, at the difficulty of coming to a decision on this. So, um, I think that, um, I don't have a vote on this, but I think that this is about as good as it gets under the circumstances, given the framework, 
I personally would like to see commercial. There's a whole issue, and I've told the developer this like multiple times. But, you know, there's a system, there's a framework, there's a set of bylaws in place, and the applicant is, is reasonably, you know, following those, as far as I can see. Um, so what I want and what I think would be good are not the same thing. <laughs> right. So um, I think what the, the I think the situation, as I said, is but is is being is reasonable under the framework that we're given, and um, and uh, that this is as good as it's going to get. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. I will call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. And that carries. And we have no motions, notices of motion, other business. We have, oh, Councillor Neal. Thank you very much. I know we rarely use other business here. Just a very quick question. It's my understanding in, in talking to Mr. Hogenbos today that there is a tentative agreement between the city and Mr. Skolnick on the boundary issue for the tanneries, or tannery, for the, uh, for the, the uh, deferral. I'm just curious when that may come back to us. I know a public meeting is, is necessary, but are we looking at November potentially? Through you, Madam Chair, I believe that that's scheduled to come back in December. Uh, I'm not directly involved in that report, and unfortunately, we don't have any of the staff working on that here this evening. But it's my understanding that it's coming back in December and that there will be another statutory public meeting because the boundary is again being adjusted. And I pledge that I won't contest if there's a recommendation the same time as the public meeting. Thank you. Um, we had one item of correspondence, and next meeting is November the 2nd. At, at alternate site. Portsmouth oh, Portsmouth Olympic Harbor. Oh, that's right. I thought it was tonight. <laughs> and then I thought, no, it's not. How many of us will arrive at 6.30 at Portsmouth Olympic Harbor? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, motion to adjourn. Councillor Turner, Councillor Neal, all those in favor, and we're adjourned. Thank you.